Join the quest. Share your views on upcoming games. Click here. Warhammer 40k Wiki. Explore. Imperium of Man. Chaos. Xenos. Videos, Games, Community. Fandom. Fan Central Beta Gam Sanam Movieist Video. Wikis. Start a wiki. AD. Advertisement. Sign in register. Welcome to the Grim Dark. 7068. Pages. Explore. Imperium of Man. Chaos. Xenos. Videos, Games, Community. In, H, Black Legion, Chaos Characters. And six more. English. Horus. View Source. An Ancient Remembrances Sketch of the War Master Horus Lupical, Primarch of the Sons of. Horus Legion, Illustration taken from Carpinius Speculum Historiale. Horus, also called Horus Lupical or more simply the Lupical during his lifetime by the Astats of his Lunar Wolves Legion, was one of the twenty genetically engineered Primarchs created by the Emperor of Mankind from the foundation of his own DNA. Before the start of the Great Crusade to lead the armies of the newborn Imperium of Man, Horus was the Primarch and Master of the xv Legion of Space Marines, the Lunar Wolves, later renamed by him the Sons of Horus. He was also the first Imperial War Master, the most favored son of the Emperor, and ultimately, the greatest traitor in the history of mankind. Horus' home world was the hive world of Ksonia which lay only a few light years from Terra. Horus was thus the first Primarch to be rediscovered by the Emperor after the Great Crusade began in the late 30th millennium. The infamous Eye of Horus Horus was responsible for unleashing the horrific civil war known as the Horus Heresy upon the Imperium of Man in the early 31st millennium which killed billions of men, women and children. In pursuit of his mad ambition to overthrow the Emperor of Mankind and replace him as the ruler of the human race, while Horus ultimately lost his bid for power and was slain by the father he had once so loved. During the Siege of Terror, his actions damaged the Imperium of Man beyond repair and inaugurated the current age of the Imperium, when mankind is beset by countless horrific dangers to its existence and the Imperium itself has become a stagnant, repressive, and dehumanizing galactic presence. Contents 1. History 01.1 Early Life 01.2 Great Crusade 01.3 Triumph of Eleanor 01.4 Corruption by Chaos 01.5 Horus Heresy Small Black Square 1.5.1 Istvaran 3 Atrocity Small Black Square 1.5.2 Preparations and Allegiances Small Black Square 1.5.3 Drop Site Massacre Small Black Square 1.5.4 Horus Triumphant Small Black Square 1.5.5 Assassination Attempt on Horus Small Black Square 1.5.5.1 Execution Team Small Black Square 1.5.5.2 Black Paria Small Black Square 1.5.5.3 Dagonit Small Black Square 1.5.5.4 Moment of Truth Small Black Square 1.5.6 Striking a Blow for Horus Small Black Square 1.5.6.1 Battle of Kalth Small Black Square 1.5.7 Sinus Prime Small Black Square 1.5.8 Battle of Terror Small Black Square 1.5.8.1 Landing on Terror Small Black Square 1.5.8.2 Siege of the Imperial Palace Small Black Square 1.5.8.3 Inquisition 
Small Black Square 1.5.8.4 Malkador the Hero. Small Black Square 1.5.8.5 Endgame. 01.6 After Death. 2 Warji. 3 Videos. 4 Sources. AD. History. Early Life. Prime Arch Horus Lupical of the Lunar Wolves Legion during the Great Crusade before his fall. To Chaos. Created as a genetically engineered organism by the Emperor in the Imperial Gene Laboratories. Under the Himalayan, Himalayan, mountains on Terra in the late 30th millennium, Horus, along with his brother Prime Archs, were scattered across the Milky Way galaxy through the warp by the machinations of the ruinous powers of chaos. This is said to be when the Dark Gods first planted the seeds of heresy into the infant Prime March, whispering darkly into his soul and tempting him to their cause. The capsule carrying the still gestating Horus came to rest on the mining world of Ksonia, the primary planet of a star system within a reasonable slower than light distance of Terra. Whereas the early history of many Prime Archs is extensively if unevenly documented, the same cannot be said of Horus. Contradiction and omission tarnishes all accounts of Horus' formative years. It is clear that the Emperor did find Horus and also that he took command of the XV Legion early in the Great Crusade. Beyond these manifest facts, agreement between the early imperial sources is decidedly lacking, some even placing Horus on Ksonia as a foundling. Like many of his superhuman brethren, these sources say that the young Primarch thrived in Ksonia's harsh environment, learning his first lessons in war and killing from Ksonia's tech. Barbarian kill gangs. The world of Ksonia had been settled in the very earliest days of Humanity's exploration of the stars, its rich natural resources ruthlessly exploited until they were all but played out. Thus, Horus grew to maturity amongst the anarchic gangers that populated the post-industrial nightmare of a world honeycombed with long extinct mines and dominated by decaying hive cities. Though Horus had not been raised during his formative years on Ksonia uncommonly. For a prime arch, he had not matured on the cradle world of his legion he spoke the harsh language known as Ksonic fluently. In fact, he spoke it with the particular hard palatal edge and rough vowels of a western hemispheric ganger, the commonest and roughest of Ksonia's feral castes. Later on, it always amused some of the battle brothers within the XV Legion to hear this accent. They assumed that Horus spoke in this manner because that was how the war master had learned the language from just such a speaker, but many would come to doubt this hypothesis later on. Horus Lupical of the Lunar Wolves early in the Great Crusade. Horus never did anything by accident and there were those who believed that the War Master's rough Ksonic accent was a deliberate affectation so that he would seem, to the astuts of the XV Legion, as honest and low-born as any of them. It was from the hyper-violent gang scum of Ksonia that many of the earliest inductees into the Space Marine Legions were recruited, and it was there that the Emperor had found the first of his lost sons. Another source claims that Horus returned to Terra itself. It is said that Horus grew at the Emperor's side, learning from his father even as they took back the Sol system and forged the alliances between the techno-barbarian nations of Terra and the Mechanicum of Mars that created the early Imperium of Man. Other highly creditable claims state that the Emperor found Horus the first of his lost sons, but neither source specifies where, or the location of this finding. Surrounded in millennia of myths and allegory, 
the truth of Horus' origins will more than likely never be known. As a result, Horus was for many standard years the emperor's only son, and there was a great affinity between them. The emperor spent much time with his protege, teaching and encouraging him. Horus was soon placed in command of the 16 Legion, which had already come to be known as the Lunar Wolves. Thousands of astats created from his own genetic code. With these transhuman warriors to lead, Horus accompanied the emperor and his Principia. Imperialis fleet for the first 30 standard years of the Great Crusade that had begun in CA 798.m30, and together they forged the initial interstellar expansion of the young Imperium of Man. A.D. Great Crusade Horus accompanied by first Captain Ezekiel Abaddon of the Lunar Wolves Elite First Company just air in Terminatus during the Great Crusade. Xonia, relatively close to Terra in the Void, and with whom some minor intermittent contact had been maintained even through the Age of Strife, had its murderous and strife-torn population marked by one of the first expeditionary fleets of the Great Crusade to leave the Sol system. With its resources stripped it had little strategic worth and its people were judged largely beyond illumination, but the fledgling Imperium needed teeth as well as ideals and that necessity saved. Xonia. Its youth was harvested in their tens of thousands, first as impressed troopers for the Crusade armies and then the finest specimens were taken for the Legion. On Luna these chosen sons of Xonia were reborn as warriors of the xv Legion. With these new recruits came a further accolade. The Emperor in honor of their new birthplace, the ruthless propensities of the Xonians and the victories of the past won by the Legion's original. Terran astards such as the first pacification of Luna, gave the xv Legion a name to strike fear into his enemies. As they scattered to spill blood amongst unclaimed stars their enemies would know them as the Lunar Wolves. For thirty standard years, the Emperor and Horus fought the opening campaigns of the Great Crusade side by side, the Primarch learning at the foot of his sire. When at length the Emperor detected another of the Primarchs and departed to locate him, Horus was left at the head of his master's hosts, the Principia Imperialis, entrusted with the command of the conquering armies. Horus was well suited to the task, and the lessons he had learned in the previous three solar decades served him well. As one by one the other Primarchs were united with their gene father and their brothers, Horus came increasingly to be regarded as the greatest of their number, the first amongst equals. When the second Primarch was found, Horus, while happy that he would soon meet one of his brothers, swore to himself that he would always remain the Emperor's favored child. The Lunar Wolves waged war for two hundred years pushing back the darkness with fire and blood. Their victories were manifold and Horus' generalship was legend, and so it was that the respect of their brother legions rose to almost unrivaled heights. While many of his brothers and the space marine legions created in their genetic image were gifted in specific fields of military science, Horus was a natural leader, his greatest genius his Ability to meld seemingly divergent allies into a coherent whole. This skill was not only of use on the battlefield, for it carried over into contacts with the peoples the Great Crusade met. It was Horus' way to treat with the populations of newly contacted worlds according to the cultural traditions of each, and this highly successful doctrine was repeated in each of the Imperial Expeditionary Fleets. Horus believed that to do so would lessen the hostile reaction of opponents who wished to parley. Tragically, 
this tendency might also have been one of the causes of the Prime Archer's fall. And with him fully half of the Space Marine Legions. As the Great Crusade pushed outward, and more Prime Archs were discovered, the Emperor's time became divided, pulled in more and more directions. Horus was often placed in overall strategic command of the Great Crusade, a position in which he proved his skill as a leader time and time again. He quickly won the approval and support of the other Space Marine Legions, along with their leaders. One of the skills that made Horus such a great leader was that he possessed an innate understanding of human psychology. He was able to read people in such a way that he could choose to promote their strengths or exploit their weaknesses. This allowed him to find a non-military solution in several campaigns as he used his sheer inhuman charisma and diplomatic negotiation skills combined with the ever-present threat of the Space Marine Legion's unstoppable force to bring other human settled worlds into Imperial compliance without bloodshed. His understanding of the human mind allowed Horus to bring out the best within his fellow Primarchs, which allowed him to deploy the various Astat's legions into the battlefield roles to which they were best suited. He quickly learned of the skill displayed by the White Scars and Night Lords in deploying for rapid strikes, while the Imperial Fists and Iron Warriors were always placed at the forefront of planetary sieges. Horus was said to wield the Space Marine Legions, and later the merely human soldiers of the Imperial Army, as a lesser general would position individual squads to perform to their advantages. He was also responsible for promoting competitive rivalries between certain Space Marine legions in the desire to spur these astats onto greater heights, but these rivalries would eventually transform into outright hatred when the Great Crusade took a turn for the worse. Triumph of Eleanor You are like a son and together we have all but conquered the galaxy. Now the time has come for me to retire to Terra. My work as a soldier is done and now passes to you for I have great tasks to perform in my earthly sanctum. I name you War Master and from this day forth all of my armies and generals shall take orders from you as if the words came from mine own mouth. But, words of caution I have for you, for your brother Primarchs are strong of will, of thought and of action. Do not seek to change them, but use their particular strengths well. You have much work. To do for there are still many worlds to liberate, many peoples to rescue. My trust is with you. Hail Horus. Hail the War Master. The Emperor of Mankind to Horus at the Triumph of Eleanor, 000.m30. The Prime Archs Horus and Fulgrim of the Emperor's Children during the Great Imperial Triumph. After the successful conclusion of the Eleanor Crusade. Though the Lunar Wolves had won many victories in their years of ceaseless conflict, one would eclipse all others and see them reborn once again. The greatest of the nascent Imperiums. Victories during the high point of the Great Crusade came in the form of the defeat of the largest Orc Empire ever encountered. The Ulanor Crusade was a vast Imperial assault on the Orc Empire of the overlord Arlak Arak. The capital world of this green-skinned stellar empire, and the site of the final assault by the space. Marine legions, lay in the central Ulanor system of the galaxy's Ulanor sector. The Crusade included the deployment of 100,000 space marines, 8 million imperial army troops, and thousands of imperial starships and their support personnel. The Eleanor Crusade marked the high point of the Great Crusade's vast effort to reunite the scattered colony worlds of humanity. 
the Orcs of Ulanor represented the largest concentration of greenskins ever defeated by the military forces of the Imperium of Man before the Third War for Armageddon began during the late 41st millennium. Following the defeat of the Orcs of Ulanor, the Emperor of Mankind returned to Terra to begin work on his vast project to open up the Elderwood Way for mankind's use. In his place to command the vast forces of the Great Crusade he left Horus. In the aftermath of this Eleanor Crusade, Horus was granted the newly created title of War Master the Commander-in-Chief of all the Emperor's armies who possessed command. Authority over all of the other Primarchs and every expeditionary fleet of the Great Crusade. Before returning to Terra to oversee the next phase of the creation of his stellar empire, the Emperor suggested to Horus that he rename the XV Legion the Sons of Horus in honor of their Primarch and to show his preeminent place amongst the other Primarchs. Horus initially declined this honor not wishing to be set above his brothers, and so his legion continued as the Lunar Wolves for a little while longer. But Horus and the other Primarchs never came to terms with the Emperor's absence. Their hurt feelings over his seeming abandonment of the Great Crusade to pursue a secret project whose purpose he chose not to reveal to his Sons laid the seeds of jealousy and resentment that would ultimately blossom into the corruption that begat the Horus heresy. Following his promotion to War Master, Horus had solicited the opinions and advice of all his brother Primarchs on the subject since the honor had been bestowed upon him. Being named, War Master set him abruptly apart from them, and raised him up above his brothers, and their had been some stifled objections and discontent, especially from those Primarchs who felt the title should have been theirs. The Primarchs were as prone to sibling rivalry and petty competition as any group of brothers. Guided by the shrewd political hand of his equerry Malagust, Horus had courted his brothers. Stilling fears, calming doubts, reaffirming pacts and generally securing their cooperation. He wanted none to feel slighted, or overlooked. He wanted none to think they were no longer listened to. Some, like Sanguinius, Lorga and Fulgrim, had acclaimed Horus's election from the outset. Others, like Angren and Pacharabo, had raged biliously at the new order, and it had taken Masterful diplomacy on the War Master's part to placate their collier and jealousy. A few, like Lemon Russ and Lion L. Johnson, had been cynically resolved, unsurprised by the turn of events. But others, like Rob Out Gilliman, Jagate I. Khan, and Rigal Dawn, had simply taken it in their stride, accepting the Emperor's decree as the right and obvious choice. Horus had ever been the brightest, the first and the favorite. They did not doubt his fitness for the role, for none of the Primarchs had ever matched Horus' achievements, nor the intimacy of his bond with the Emperor. It was to these solid, resolved brothers that Horus turned in particular for counsel. Dawn and Gilliman both embodied the staunchest and most dedicated imperial qualities, commanding their legions' expeditions with peerless devotion and military genius. Horus desired their approval as a young man might seek the quiescence of older, more accomplished brothers. Corruption by Chaos The War Master Horus in his Dark Mechanicum forged Terminator armor. Shortly after the Lunar Wolves Legion and their allies declared victory in the Great Ulanor, Crusade against the mightiest Orc Empire faced by the Imperium until the 41st millennium, the Emperor offered Horus the honor of renaming his legion the Sons of Horus in honor of himself and to show his preeminent place among the other Primarchs. Horus refused this honor, 
characteristically not wishing to be set above his brothers, but was promoted to the newly created rank of Imperial War Master, serving as the new Supreme Commander of the Imperium's millions-strong armies. The Emperor then left the Crusade in Horus' capable hands and returned to Terra to pursue the secret Imperial Webway project that he hoped would draw the newborn Imperium together in unbreakable bonds. Despite the majestic rank and unparalleled authority bestowed on him, it was said that Horus was not content. The wording of the Emperor's declaration, claiming the glory of Horus' victories as entirely his own, chafed. Although this was the usual rhetoric for such Imperial announcements, Horus saw that while the Emperor remained behind in the Imperial Palace on Terra for reasons that he would not share even with his sons, Horus would be out in the field of battle, winning the Emperor's Imperium for him. It seemed that a deep-rooted resentment and jealousy had begun to simmer in the corners of the War Master's mind. As the Imperial War Master, Horus took over command of the Great Crusade, and accepted his new duties with earnest dedication. However, there was much dissension in the ranks of the Primarchs and other parties in the Imperium over the Emperor's decision to withdraw from the campaign and return to Terra as well as to reorganize the political administration of the Imperium under the control of a council of Terra headed by his regent, Malkador the Sigilite. Only a handful of the Primarchs, amongst them a scheming lawgar, remained steadfast beside the war master during this period of conflict. Horus also disagreed with many of the decrees passed by the newly established Council of Terror, a ruling body of imperial nobles and bureaucrats, which were intended to shift the burden of taxation and administration onto the newly conquered imperial compliant worlds. Even worse, Horus came to believe in his heart that he was failing his father, and was deeply wounded that the Emperor had revealed to none of the Primarchs, not even his most favored son, why he had secluded himself upon terror and the truth behind his secret Imperial Webway project. These seeds of bitterness, resentment and frustration grew, and would soon bear deadly fruit. It was around this time that Horus, upon the advice and counsel of his greatest friend among his fellow Primarchs, Sanguinius of the Blood Angels, decided to change the name of the Lunar Wolves to the Sons of Horus after all. Sanguinius had argued that the Emperor had suggested the honor precisely to show his great confidence in Horus. Bearing such a designation would show the other Primarchs that Horus had earned his right to command them through the Emperor's trust in his judgment and leadership. First Chaplain Erebus of the Word Bearers, the XVIth Space Marine Legion that was secretly in league with the forces of Chaos since they had been humiliated by the Emperor for their violations of the Imperial Truth on the world of Khur over forty Terran years before the start of the Horus Heresy, became a very close confidant and advisor of Horus. The words bearers, who originally had worshipped the Emperor as a god and whose Primarch Lorga had penned the Lectitio Divinitatus before he turned against his father following. The events on Khur, had been brutally reprimanded for their constant erection of temples and Shrines dedicated to the worship of the god-emperor on newly conquered worlds. This was a policy that had directly violated the emperor's atheistic imperial truth and had slowed the XVIth Legion's progress in the Great Crusade to a crawl. In the wake of his humiliation and the reprimand against his legion on Khur, Lorga had sought to discover whether there truly were divinities worthy of human worship during the quest that came to be known as the Pilgrimage of Lorga. During this journey, 
Lorga entered the Eye of Terror and came face to face with the power of Chaos, a force that he believed was truly divine and worthy of his service and the worship of all mankind. He brought this faith to his legion, and soon all the astuts of the word-bearers believed that the Chaos Gods were more worthy of their loyalty and worship than the Emperor who had proved himself to be a false god. With the guidance of the ruinous powers, Lorga and the word Bearers hatched their secret plans over the course of the next four solar decades to convert humanity to the service of the Dark Gods, starting with Horus. First Chaplain Erebus with the stolen Kinebrachene theme. After Lorga placed his agent near Horus, Erebus slowly managed to twist the thinking of Horus against the Emperor and turn half of the Mornival, the War Master's most trusted advisors within the XV Ith Legion, towards the same path of treachery by exploiting their intense loyalty to their prime arch over that for their far more distant emperor. This plot reached its climax on the moon of the feral world of Davon, where Horus was wounded during a struggle against Eugen. Temba, the former planetary governor of Davon who had rebelled against the Imperium, following his corruption by chaos. An ancient Zeno's artifact blade sacred to Nurgle known as the Kinebrachenathame had been stolen by Rebus from the museum of an advanced human civilization called the Intex during the Sons of Horus brief sojourn on their world of Zenobia and had been given by him to Temba. Temba had become the mutated servant of Nurgle, the chaos god of disease and decay, and managed to seriously wound the War Master with the corrupted blade. The apothecaries of the XV Ith Legion proved incapable of healing the War Master's wounds despite every form of advanced medical technology at their disposal, until it seemed that Horus would surely die. Erebus then convinced the officers of the Sons of Horus Warrior Lodge to allow him to take the War master to a secret sect on Davon's moon and use sorcery at this Temple of the Serpent. Lodge in order to treat Horus. The creation of a warrior lodge within the Lunar Wolves and many other space marine legions based on the lodges used by the savage warriors of Davon had been. Another of Lorga and Erebus ploys to infiltrate and corrupt the Astards into turning against the Emperor across the decades. However, not all Astards of the Legions joined the Lodges, as many saw them as a direct violation of the Emperor's desires that all Space Marines dedicate themselves to truth and openness with others and among themselves. He also presciently believed that secret cabals created within military organizations almost always led eventually to conspiracies and betrayal. The lodges would prove to be the primary purveyors of corruption in those legions which turned traitor in the days immediately preceding the start of the Horus heresy. Those astuts within those legions which lodges which held themselves aloof from those secretive organizations were marked as imperial loyalists who would later be betrayed at Istvaran III. The Serpent Lodge on Davon was in truth a chaos cult, and using sorcery, which was outlawed by the Emperor, the cultists managed to warp the mind of the War Master against the Emperor by playing on the seed of jealousy and resentment that he felt for his father after the Emperor had left the Great Crusade behind to return to Terra. During the dark rituals that followed within the temple, Horus' spirit was transferred from his body into the Imatrium. There, he bore witness to a nightmare vision of the future. He saw the Imperium of Man as a repressive, violent theocracy, where the Emperor and several of his prime archs, but not Horus, were worshipped as gods by the masses. While this vision of the Imperial future granted by the Chaos Gods was a true one, it was ironically an outcome largely created by the War Master's own actions.
the Dark Gods portrayed themselves as victims of the Emperor's psychic might, and claimed that they had no real interest in the happenings of the material world. Magnus the Red, the Sorcerer's Primarch of the Thousand Suns Legion, had also travelled into the warp via sorcery to try and stop Horus from turning to chaos. Magnus explained that the War Master's vision was only one among many possible futures, but one that Horus alone could prevent. But Horus, already jealous and resentful of the Emperor, proved all too receptive to the ruinous power's false vision. The Chaos God's pact with Horus was simple, give us the Emperor and we will give you the galaxy. Driven by his jealousy, desire for power and anger at what he saw as his father's abandonment of him, Horus accepted the ruinous power's offer. They healed his grievous wound and filled him with the powers of the warp. Renouncing his oath to the Emperor, Horus led his legion into worship of the myriad chaos gods in the form of chaos undivided. He then sought to turn many of his fellow Primarchs to the service of Chaos, and succeeded with Angren of the World Eaters, Fulgrim of the Emperors, Children and Mortarian of the Death God, who were the first of many to follow, along with many regiments of the Imperial Army and several Titan legions of the Adeptus Mechanicus. Magnus the Red, the Primarch of the Thousand Suns Legion, foresaw Horus' actions through his legion's own use of psychic sorcery that had been forbidden several years earlier at the Council of Nikia. Magnus then attempted to forewarn the Emperor of the impending betrayal of his favorite son. However, knowing that he would have to find a means of quickly warning the Emperor, Magnus used sorcery to send his message by taking on astral form in the warp. The message ultimately penetrated the potent psychic defenses of the Imperial Palace on Terra, shattering all the psychic wards the Emperor had placed on the palace including those within his secret project in the Imperial Dungeons, where he was proceeding with the creation of the human extension into the webway. Refusing to believe that Horus, his most beloved and trusted son, would actually betray him, the Emperor instead mistakenly perceived the traitor to the Imperium to be Magnus and his thousand sons, who had long suffered from a near debilitating run of mutations known as the flesh change because of the instability of Magnus' own genome and were known to have practiced the sorcery that had been expressly outlawed in the Imperium. The Emperor ordered the Primarch Lemon Russ, Magnus' greatest rival, to mobilize his space. Wolves Legion and the Witch Hunters known as the Sisters of Silence and take Magnus into custody to be returned to Terra to stand trial for violating the Council of Nikia's prohibitions against the use of psychic powers within the Imperium. While en route to the Thousand Suns Legion's home world of Prospero, Horus convinced Russ, who had always been repelled and horrified by Magnus' reliance on psychic powers, to launch a full assault on Prospero instead, even though Magnus had been entirely willing to face the Emperor's judgment once he realized he was being manipulated by the entities that called the Imatrium home. In this way, Horus was successful in convincing Russ to become Magnus' executioner instead of his gaoler. The burning of Prospero was the tragic result. Horus' heresy. Istvaran III atrocity. The virus bombing of Istvaran III begins. The battle of Istvaran III begins in earnest, after the virus bombing of the planet. The initial phase of the Horus heresy begins on the surface of Istvaran III. Unknown to the Emperor, the Word Bearer's Legion had been devoted to Chaos Undivided for some time before this event. The Imperial Planetary Governor of Istvaran III, Vardas Pral, had 
been corrupted by the chaos god Slanesh whose cultists had long been active on the world. Prahl had declared his independence from the Imperium, and practiced forbidden sorcery, so. The Council of Terror charged Horus with the retaking of that world, primarily its capital, the Coral City. This order merely furthered Horus' plans to overthrow the Emperor. Although the four legions under his direct command the Sons of Horus, the World Eaters, the Death Guard and the Emperor's children had already turned traitor and now pledged themselves to chaos, there were still some loyalist elements within each of these legions that approximated one third of each force. Many of these warriors were Terran-born space marines who had been directly recruited into the Astats legions by the Emperor himself before being reunited with their Primarchs during the Great Crusade. Horus, under the guise of putting down the religious rebellion against imperial compliance on the world of Istvaran III, amassed his troops in the Istvaran system. Horus had a plan by which he would destroy all the remaining loyalist elements of the legions. Under his command, a plan that would ultimately unfold into the nightmare of what imperial scholars would later name the Istvaran III atrocity. After a lengthy bombardment of Istvaran III, Horus dispatched all of the known loyalist astats down to the planet, under the pretense of bringing it back into the Imperium. At the moment of victory and the capture of the Coral City, the planetary capital of Istvaran III, these astats were betrayed when a cascade of terrible virus bombs fell onto the world, launched by the War Master's orbiting fleet. Captain Saul, Tarvitz of the Emperor's children, however, was aboard his legion's flagship Andronius and discovered the plot to wipe out the loyalist astats of the traitor legions. He was able, with help from battle captain Nathaniel Garrow of the Death Guard who was in command of the Death Guard frigate Eisenstein, to reach the surface of Istvaran III despite pursuit and warn the Loyalist space marines he could find of all four legions of their impending doom. Those that heard or passed on Tarvitz's warning took shelter before the virus bombs struck. The civilian population of Istvaran III received no such protection, 8 billion people died almost at once as the lethal flesh-dissolving virus called the life eater carried by the bombs infected every living thing on the planet. The psychic shock of so many deaths at one time shrieked through the warp, briefly obscuring even the Astronomicon. The prime arch of the World Eaters, Angren, realizing that the virus bombs had not been fully effective at eliminating all the loyalists, flew into a rage and hurled himself at the planet with fifty companies of traitor marines. Discarding Tactics and strategy, the World Eaters Legion's traitors worked themselves into a frenzy of mindless butchery. Horus was furious with Angren for delaying his plans, but the War Master sought to turn the delay into a victory and was obliged to reinforce Angren with troops from the Sons of Horus, the Death God, and the Emperor's children. Fortunately, a contingent of Loyalists led by battle captain Garrow escaped Istvaran III aboard the damaged Imperial frigate Eisenstein and fled to terror to warn the Emperor that Horus had turned traitor. On Istvaran III, the remaining Loyalists, under the command of captains Tarvitz, Garviel, Loken and Tarik Torgidon, another Loyalist member of the Sons of Horus, fought bravely against their own traitorous brethren. Yet, despite some early successes that delayed Horus, plans for three full months while the battle on Istvaran III played out, their cause was ultimately doomed by their lack of air support and titan firepower. During the battle the sons of Horus 
Captains Ezekiel Baden and Horace Aximand were sent to confront their former Morneville brothers, Loken and Torgidon. Horace Aximand beheaded Torgidon, but Abaddon failed to kill Loken when the building they were in collapsed. Loken survived and witnessed the final orbital bombardment of Istvaran III that ended the Loyalists' desperate defense. To prove his worth and loyalty to Lord Commander Eidolon of the Emperor's children, and thus to his prime arch, Fulgrim Captain Lucius of the 13th Company of the Emperor's children, the future champion of Slanesh known as Lucius the Eternal, turned against the loyalists that he had fought beside because of his prior friendship with Saul Tarvitz. Lucius slew many of them personally, an act for which he was then accepted back into the Emperor's children on the side of the traitors. In the end, the loyalists retreated to their last bastion of defense, only a few hundred of their number remaining. Finally, tired of the conflict, Horus ordered his men to withdraw, and then had the remains of the coral city bombarded into dust. For a final time from orbit, preparations and allegiances, much of Horus' later success arose from the thorough groundwork he had laid before the opening shots of the heresy were fired at Istvaran III. He had already swayed the Primarch Sangren and Mortarion, of the World Eaters and Death Guard legions, respectively, to the side of chaos because of their own various personal grudges against the Emperor. Fulgrim of the Emperor's children had been lured to the side of the War Master by the promise of power and personal perfection that the Chaos Gods, especially Slanesh, offered to him and his vain astuts. Lorger of the Word Bearers, who had been responsible for the nascent rebellion and Horus's own corruption by Chaos, was also with the War Master. Three of the most loyal legions who could not be swayed to the side of chaos, the Dark Angels, Blood Angels and Ultramarines and their Primarchs, were sent on missions by the War Master Fa. From Terra and the Istvaran system, the Imperial Fists and White Scars were too close to Terra to be contacted without raising suspicion, though Horus believed mistakenly that the White Scar's Prime Arch Jagate Icon would ultimately take his side. Shortly before the drop site massacre on Istvaran V, Fulgrim also attempted to sway his friend Ferus Manus of the Iron Hands Legion to Horus' cause by using many of the same inducements that had been offered to the Adeptus Mechanicus, with whom the Iron Hands were closely allied in both temperament and philosophy. This attempt failed, and Fulgrim barely escaped with his life. Angered by the rebuff, Fulgrim promised he would deliver Manu's severed head to Horus in recompense, a promise he kept on Istvaran V. The Blood Angels were sent to the demon-infested Sinus Cluster, and the Ultramarines to the world of Kalth, where a large word-bearer's force, under first. Captain Corfran had massed to hold Rob out Gilliman's equally massive legion in place. While Horus made his play for terror of the other eventual traitor Primarchs, Conrad Kurz, the Night Haunter, was due to face disciplinary action from the Emperor which he did not believe he deserved, the Alpha. Legion Primarch Alphaurus had always been closer personally to his brother Horus than to his Father the Emperor, although some evidence indicates that he and his twin brother Omegans turn to chaos was driven by mistaken loyalty to the Emperor, and the Iron Warriors. Primarch Pacharabo's open and bitter rivalry with Rigaldorn of the Imperial Fists and his feeling that he and his legion were handed the worst tasks in the Great Crusade for which they never received the recognition they believed they were due made him an easy target for corruption. 
The Thousand Sons had never planned to join Horus, but the path Psinch had mapped for that. Legion and their potent psychic prime Arch Magnus the Red ultimately led them. To chaos regardless. Unfortunately, the Space Wolves' unexpected assault on the Thousand Sun's home world a brutal campaign remembered as the scouring of Prospero resulted in the destruction of the libraries of precious knowledge that Magnus and his fellow Thousand Sons held so dear. Mortally wounded by Lemon Russ, Magnus fell to temptation as he watched Tizka the capital city of Prospero and its famed libraries of ancient knowledge burn and he called out to the chaos god Psinch to save both himself and the remains of his legion. The god of sorcery was only too happy to oblige and he transported Magnus and the Thousand Sons through the warp to the demon world later known as the planet of the sorcerers. Magnus became a demon prince of Tsinch and now desired only vengeance against the emperor for what he saw as a betrayal, never realizing that it was Horus who had truly engineered his downfall and corruption. The remaining space marine legions the Raven God, Salamanders, Iron Hands and Space Wolves remained staunchly loyal to the emperor, though all but the space wolves would pay dearly for it in the battles to come. Beyond the legions, Horus had already swayed Magos, Regulus of the Adeptus Mechanicus to his side with promises of the standard template. Construct, STC, databases of ancient technology recovered during the war with the Aurishan. Technocracy. This alliance delivered crucial Adeptus Mechanicus and Titan support to the War Masters Traitor Legion and Traitor Imperial Army Forces. Meanwhile, Horus and his confidant and mentor in the ways of chaos, the word bearers first. Chaplain Erebus, conducted a ritual designed to communicate with the chaotic entities of the warp. They established contact with a demon called Sakel, who acted as an emissary of the chaos gods to Horus and the traitor legions. Horus was then deceived by the demon into believing that the chaos gods had no interest in dominating the material universe, and were only lending their support so that Horus could overthrow the emperor, who they claimed was creating devices that could destroy the demonic beings of the Imatrium. Horus agreed, and promised to swear loyalty to Chaos Undivided after his fateful operations on Istvaran III. Drop Site Massacre An assembly of the leaders of the forces of Chaos from the time of the Horus Heresy. Overseeing the launch of the Furious Abyss, from left to right, Erebus, Kelbor, Hal, Malagurst, Abaddon, Horus, the Red Angel, Ahriman, Injethil the Ascended, and Fulgrim. The Istvaran system's third world, comfortably close enough to the Istvanian sun to support human life, had become a virus-soaked mass grave marking the anger of Horus Lupical in the aftermath of the Istvaran III atrocity that marked the start of the Horus heresy. The world's population was nothing more than contaminated ash scattered over lifeless continents, while the bones of their cities remained as blackened smears of burnt stone a civilization reduced to memory in but a single day. The orbital bombardment from the War Master's fleet, payloads, composed of incendiary shells and virus-laden biological warfare pods, had seemingly spared nothing and no one anywhere on the world. Istvaran III lingered in silent orbit around its sun. Almost grand in the extent of its absolute devastation, serving as the scarred tombstone for the death of an empire. With the destruction of the last surviving warriors on Istvaran III, the traitor. Legions of Horus made their way to Istvaran V, a flotilla of powerful warships and carriers bearing the martial pride of four space marine legions, 
their ranks fully comprised of those whose loyalty was to Horus and Horus alone. Mass conveyors of Imperial Army units brought millions of armed men and their tanks and artillery pieces. Bloated Dark Mechanicum transports bore the Legio Mortis to Istvaran V, the Dark Tech priests ministering to the Dysiri and its sister titans as they prepared to unleash the unimaginable power of those war machines once more. Final victory for the traitors on Istvaran III had been bought with many lives, but in its wake the traitor legions were tempered in the crucible of combat to do what must be done to seize control of the Imperium. The process had been long and bloody, but the War Master's army was ready and eager to fight its brothers, where the lackeys of the Emperor would find their readiness to strike down their kith and kin untested. Such mercy would be their undoing, Horus promised. Horus would strike a vicious blow against the Imperium and the false Emperor. Blow that would resonate down through the millennia for all time. As Horus made the opening moves of his rebellion on Istvaran III, Ferus Manu's oldest and dearest friend Fulgrim was ordered by the War Master to meet with the Iron Hand's Primarch aboard his flagship Fist of Iron in the hope that he could be swayed to the side of the traitor. Legions who now served chaos. Fulgrim had sent the bulk of his three legion and the 28th expeditionary fleet on to meet Horus and the 63rd expeditionary fleet in the Istvaran system. While he and a small force aided the Iron Hand's 52nd expeditionary fleet in retaking the world of Kalinides IV from Orcs. Great bonds of friendship and brotherhood had long existed between the two legions, and Fulgrim felt that he could convince Ferus of the righteousness of Horus. Cause. Fulgrim's hope proved disastrously wrong and the meeting of the two Primarchs in Ferus' private inner sanctum in his flagship Sanvalorum did not go well, as Ferus was utterly outraged that his brothers would turn against their father the Emperor. The meeting ended in violence as the Gorgon made his difference of opinion over continued loyalty to the Emperor. Known to the Phoenician with his weapons, determined to stop Fulgrim's betrayal of the Imperium before it could begin. The War Master was enraged at Fulgrim's failure at converting their brother Ferus to their cause. Nevertheless, he still had to make preparations for the inevitable response of the Emperor, which was likely to arrive more quickly than anticipated and the traitors needed to be prepared for it. Fulgrim was tasked to take a detail of Emperor's children to the ruins of the alien fortresses that existed on Istvaran V and prepare that world for the final phase of the Istvaran operation. Though the Phoenician recoiled at the horrifying prospect of the menial role placed upon him, Horus explained that the Istvaran V phase of his plan was the most critical, and he could entrust this vital task to no other. Fulgrim supervised the vast teams of Dark Mechanicus. Earth movers as they shifted the black sand of Istvaran V and formed a vast network of earthworks, trenches, bunkers and redoubts that stretched along the ridge of the Urgol Plateau. Lagers of anti-aircraft batteries were set up in the shadow of the walls, and mighty orbital torpedoes on mobile launch vehicles hid in the warrens of an ancient alien fortress. Fulgrim had set up his command within the remains of the keep and begun the work of ensuring that it would be a bastion worthy of the war master. If the Emperor's legions wanted to destroy the traitors, they were going to have to come down to the surface of Istvaran V to do so, as no abital bombardment would be powerful enough to dislodge the defenders or crack their resolve. Overcome with mind-numbing rage at their brother's treachery, Ferus Manus and his iron. Hans Legion gratefully received the Emperor's orders through his brother Rigel Dawn. In 
response to Horus' betrayal of the loyalist Astats in the Sons of Horus, Emperors. Children, World Eaters and Death Guard Legions at Istvaran III, the Prime Arch of the Imperial. Fist's Legion, Rigaldorn, on the direction of the Emperor who had learned of Horus' actions. From the Loyalist survivors aboard the Eisenstein, ordered seven Loyalist Space Marine. Legions to Horus base on the world of Istvaran V to challenge the War Master's rebellion. They would attack in two waves and fall under the supreme command of the Iron Hands Prime Arch Ferus Manus. The legions comprising the first wave were the Iron Hands, Salamanders, and the Raven God. The legions comprising the second wave, who would arrive at Istvaran V after the first wave, were the Alpha Legion, Night Lords, Iron Warriors, and a large contingent of word bearers that their Prime Arch Lager had stationed in the star system. Unknown to Dawn and Ferus Manus, the Night Lords, Alpha Legion, Iron Warriors and word bearers had all turned from their service to the Emperor and pledged their loyalty to Horus and been instructed to keep their new allegiance to Chaos a secret. Thousands of drop pods and stormbirds were deployed for the initial assault. The first wave was under the overall command of the Prime Arch Ferus Manus and besides his own XTH Legion. The Salamanders led by Vulcan, and the Raven Guard under the command of their Prime Arch Corax joined him. Vulcan's legion assaulted the left flank of the traitor's battle line. While Ferus Manus, the Iron Hand's first captain Gabriel Santia, and ten full companies of elite Morlocks Terminators charged straight into the center of the enemy lines. Meanwhile, Korax's legion hit the right flank of the enemy's position. The odds were considered equal. 30,000 traitor marines against 40,000 loyalists. Horus was aware of the location of the loyalists chosen drop site and his troops fell upon the loyalist legions. The battlefield of Istvaran V was a slaughterhouse of epic proportions. Treacherous warriors, twisted by hatred fought their former brothers in arms in a conflict unparalleled in its bitterness. The mighty titan war engines of the machine god walked the planet's surface and death followed in their wake. The blood of heroes and traitors flowed in rivers, and the hooded heretics adepts of the dark mechanicum unleashed perversions of ancient technology. Stolen from the Orishan technocracy to wreak bloody havoc amongst the loyalists. All across the Urgall Depression. Hundreds died with every passing second, the promise of inevitable death a pall of darkness that hung over every warrior. The traitor forces held, but their line was bending beneath the fury of the first loyalist assault. It would take only the smallest twists of fate for it to break. The forces on the surface have been embattled for almost three hours with no clear victor emerging. The loyalists waited for the second wave of allies to make planet fall. Believing they would be reinforced for their final advance. The traitors all knew their parts to play. In this performance. They were all aware of the blood they must shed to spare their species. From destruction, and install Horus as the master of mankind. Though the Iron Hands. Raven Guard and Salamanders had managed to make a full combat. Drop and secured the drop site, the Urgall Depression, they did so at a heavy cost. Overwhelmed with rage, the headstrong Ferus Manus disregarded the counsel of his brothers. Korax and Vulcan and hurled himself against the fleeing rebels, seeking to bring Fulgrim to personal combat. His veteran troops comprising the majority of the XTH Legion's Terminatus and Dreadnoughts followed. What had begun as a massed strike against the traitor's position 
was rapidly turning into one of the largest engagements of the entire Great Crusade. All told, over 60,000 Astats warriors clashed on the dusky plains of Istvan v. For all the wrong reasons, this battle was soon to go down in the annals of imperial history as one of the most epic confrontations ever fought. The Urgal Depression was churned to ruination beneath the boots and tank treads of countless thousands of Astats warriors and their legions' armor divisions. The loyal Primarch could be found where the fighting was thickest, Korax of the Raven God, borne aloft on black wings. Bound to a fire-breathing flight pack, Lord Ferus of the Iron Hands at the heart of the battlefield. His silver hands crushing any traitors that came within reach, while he pursued and dragged back those who sought to withdraw, and lastly, Vulcan of the Salamanders, armored in overlapping artificer plating, thunder clapping from his war hammer as it pounded into yielding armor, shattering it like porcelain. The traitorous Primarch slew in mirror image to their brothers, Angren of the World Eaters. Hewing with wild abandon as he raked his shane axes left and right, barely cognizant of who fell. Before him, Fulgrim of the lamentably named Emperor's children, laughing as he deflected the clumsy sweeps of Iron Hand's warriors, never stopping in his graceful movements for even a moment, Mortarion of the Death God, in disgusting echo of ancient Terran myth, harvesting. Life with each reaving sweep of his scythe. And Horus, war master of the Imperium, the brightest star and greatest of the Emperor's sons. He stood watching the destruction while his legions took to the field, their liege lord content in. His fortress rising from the far edge of the ravine. Shielded and unseen by his brothers still. Waging war in the Emperor's name. At last, above this maelstrom of grinding karamite, booming tank cannons and chattering bolters the gunships, drop pods and assault landers of the second wave burned through the atmosphere on screaming thrusters. The sky fell dark with the weak sun eclipsed by ten thousand avian shadows, and the cheering roar sent up by the loyalists was loud enough to shake the air itself. The traitors, the blooded and battered legions, loyal to Horus, fell into a fighting withdrawal without hesitation. The second wave of loyalist space marine legions descended upon the landing zone on the northern edge of the Urgal Depression. Hundreds of stormbirds and thunderhawks roared towards the surface, their armored hulls gleaming as the power of another four astuts. Legions arrived on Istvaran v. Yet the Space Marine legions of the reserve were no longer loyal to the Emperor, having already secretly sworn themselves to chaos and the cause of Horus. The Night Lords of Conrad Kuz, the Iron Warriors of Pacharabo, the Word Bearers of Lorga or Orion, and the Alpha Legion of Alphorus represented a force larger than that which had first begun the Assault on Istvaran v. The secret traitor legions mustered in the landing zone, armed and ready. For battle, unblooded and fresh. The Iron Warriors had claimed the highest ground, taking the loyalist landing site with all the appearance of reinforcing it through the erection of prefabricated plasteel bunkers. Bulk landers dropped the battlefield architecture. Dense metal frames fell from the cargo claws of carrier ships at low altitude, and as the platforms crashed and embedded themselves in the ground, the craftsmen warriors of the IVTH Legion worked, affixed, bolted and constructed them into hastily rising fire bases. Turrets rose from their protective housing in the hundreds, while hordes of lobotomized servitors trundled from the holds of Iron Warriors troopships, single-minded in their intent to link with the weapons systems interfaces. The word-bearers bolstered their 
brother legions on one flank of the Urgall depression while the night lords took positions on the opposite side. Down the line, past the mounting masses of iron warriors battle tanks and assembling astats, first captain Sevatar of the night lords and his first company elite, the Atramentar took up defensive positions. Both the word bearers and the night lords were to be the anvil, while the iron warriors would be the hammer yet to fall. The enemy would stagger back to them, exhausted, clutching empty bolters and broken blades, believing their presence to be a reprieve. Ferus Manus confronts Fulgrim amidst the backdrop of the drop site massacre of Istvaran. V. During the Horus Heresy. Dragging their wounded and dead behind them, Korax and Vulcan led their forces back to the drop site to regroup and to allow the warriors of their recently arrived brother Primarchs of the second wave a measure of the glory in defeating Horus. Though they voxed Hales requesting medical aid and supply, the line of Astards atop the northern ridge remained grimly silent as the Exhausted warriors of the Raven Guard and Salamanders came to within a hundred meters of their allies. It was then that Horus revealed his perfidy and sprung his lethal trap. Inside the black fortress where Horus had made his lair, a lone flare shot skyward, exploding in a hellish red glow that lit the battlefield below. The fire of betrayal roared from the barrels of a thousand guns, as the second wave of Astards revealed where their true loyalties now lay. Ferus Manus looked on in stunned horror as Fulgrim laughed at the look on his brother's face as the forces of his allies opened fire upon the Salamanders and Raven God, killing hundreds in the fury of the first few moments, hundreds more in the seconds following, as volley after volley of Bolter Fire and missiles scythed through their unsuspecting ranks. Even as terrifying carnage was being wreaked upon the loyalists below, the retreating forces of the War Master turned and brought their weapons to bear on the enemy warriors within their midst. Hundreds of world eaters, sons of Horus and the Death Guard fell upon the veteran companies of the Iron Hands, and though the warriors of the XTH Legion continued to fight gallantly, they were hopelessly outnumbered and would soon be hacked to pieces. The Iron Hands had damned themselves by remaining in the field. The Raven Guard front ranks went down as if scythed, harvested in a spilling line of detonating bolter shells, shattered armor and puffs of bloody mist. Black armored astards tumbled to their hands and knees, only to be cut down by the sustained volley, finishing those who fell beneath the initial storm of head and chest shots. Seconds after the first chatter of bolters, beams of achingly bright laser slashed from behind the word bearers as the cannon mounts of land raiders, predators and defensive bastion turrets gouged through the raven guard and the ground they stood upon. The Iron Warriors and Word Bearers kept reloading, opening fire again, hurling grenades and prepared to fall back. The Word Bearers Legion had taken up landing positions on the west of the field, ready to sweep down and engage the Raven Guard from the flank. Traitors and Loyalists clash in the Urgall Depression. The Raven Guard were confronted by the treacherous Word Bearers with their prime arch lauger. The first captain Corfran and the first chaplain Erebus at their vanguard. The two legions fought one another in bitter combat. In the midst of this battle, the word bearers unleashed the elite unit known as the Galvorback Astards who had allowed themselves to be possessed by daemons. They attacked the raven guard's prime arch en masse. But despite the advantage of their numbers, Korax's formidable abilities as a consummate warrior proved to be more than a 
match for the possessed astards, and he slew them with impunity. Seeing the slaughter of his most favoured sons, Lorga intervened and prevented the death of the remaining Galvor back. Astards The two opposing Primarchs then dueled one another in close combat, and the Raven Guard's Primarch quickly gained the upper hand over his outmatched brother. Lorga had always been more of a scholar than a warrior and Korax prepared to execute him for his betrayal of the Emperor. Lorga was spared from execution by the intervention of the Night Lords. Primarch, Conrad Kuz, at the last moment. The Night Haunter and the Raven fought a brutal melee. Kurz quickly gained the upper hand over his battle-weary brother and prepared to slay him, but Korax managed to escape death by taking to the sky with his master-crafted jump pack. The outnumbered loyalists were then surrounded and brutally butchered. Refusing to surrender, the remaining Raven Guard and Salamander's Astards stubbornly defended themselves trying to hold off the inevitable slaughter for as long as possible. Though they suffered an atrocious number of casualties, the loyalists managed to hold their own, until the Primarch Smortarion of the Death Guard and Angren of the World Eaters joined the fray. Bolstered by the support of the infamous Imperator-class Titan Dysiri, the traitors killed tens of thousands of loyalist astuts. At the height of the massacre the War Master Horus entered the fray, at the head of the elite sons of Horus Terminatus known as the Just Erin, slaughtering the loyalists in wrathful anger. Any hope for escape for the loyalists was quickly crushed when the traitorous Ion warriors destroyed the first wave's drop ships. The loyalist starships still orbiting the embattled planet were also largely annihilated by the vastly superior numbers of the traitor's fleet. Despite the odds arrayed against them, some of the loyalists on the ground managed to survive against these odds, they miraculously escaped through the tightening cordon of traitors that surrounded their position. The Raven Guard fared better than the Salamanders in escaping the brutal massacre. But the Salamanders managed to assist a few surviving Astuts from the decimated Iron Hands Legion to also escape the slaughter. Imperial history does not record the fate of these surviving Salamanders or their missing Primarch Vulcan. The Raven Guards Primarch just barely managed to board a fleeing Thunderhawk gunship to make good his escape but was thwarted in the attempt when it was shot down almost immediately by the gunfire of the traitors. The badly damaged ship crashed on the outskirts of the Urgol Plateau. Horus triumphant. The road to terror is open. The time has come for us to take the war to the Emperor in his most impregnable fastness. We will make immediate preparation for the invasion of terror and an Assault on the Imperial Palace. Make no mistake, and it will be ours, my brothers. This will be no easy task, for the Emperor and his deluded followers will fight hard to prevent us from interfering with his plans for godhood. Doubtless much blood has yet to be spilled, theirs and our own, but the prize is the galaxy itself, are you with me? War Master Horus, Master of Istvaran. War Master Horus stands triumphant. After the killing had stopped and the dead were gathered into great funeral pyres across the broken desert of the Urgol Depression, the once grey skies of the planet burned orange with the reflected glow of a thousand pyres. The firelight bathed the rippling, glassy sands in a warm radiance and towering pillars of black smoke from the burning corpses filled the air. Thousands of Astuts loyal to Horus gathered before a great reviewing stand, constructed by the Tech. 
priests of the Dark Mechanicus with astonishing speed. As the sun began to sink beyond the horizon, the smooth black plains of the stand shone with a blood-red glow. The stand was erected as a series of cylinders of ever-decreasing diameter, one standing atop another. The base was perhaps a thousand meters in width, constructed as a great grandstand upon which the sons of Horus stood, their preeminent position as the elite of the War Master in no doubt. After this great victory, each warrior bore a flaming brand, and the firelight cast brilliant reflections from their armor. Atop this pedestal of flame was another platform, occupied by the senior officers of the 16. Legion. Above the senior officers of the Sons of Horus stood the traitor Primarchs. The sheer magnificence of such a gathering of might was breathtaking. Seven beings of monumental power stood on the penultimate tier of the reviewing stand, their armor still stained with the blood of their foes, their cloaks billowing in the winds that swept the Urgall depression. Finally, the uppermost tier of the reviewing stand was a tall cylinder of crimson that stood a hundred meters above the prime arches. Horus stood on top of it, his clawed gauntlets raised in salute. A third cloak of some great beast hung from his shoulders, and the light of the corpse pyres reflected from the amber eye upon his breastplate. The war master was illuminated from below by a hidden light source, bathing him in a red glow that gave him the appearance of the statue of a legendary hero, as he stood looking down on the endless sea of his followers from the towering platform. An eye of Horus symbol like this one was burned into the northern slopes of the Urgall. Depression to mark the traitor's victory on Istvaran v. As the sun finally dipped below the horizon, a flight of assault craft roared over the Urgall hills, their wings dipping in salute to the mighty warrior below. Solid waves of cheering crashed against the reviewing stand, howls of adulation torn from tens of thousands of throats. No. Sooner had the aircraft passed overhead than the mastastards began to march around the reviewing stand their arms snapping out and hammering their breastplates in salute of the war master. At some unseen signal a flame ignited on the northern slopes of the Urgall. Depression and a blazing line of phosphor leapt across the ground in a snaking arc that described the outline of an enormous blazing eye upon the hillside. The adulation soared to new. Heights as the Eye of Horus seared itself into the sands of Istvan v, the War Master's forces, roaring themselves hoarse in his praise. Super heavy tanks fired in salute of Horus, and the towering immensity of the Dizeri inclined its massive head in a gesture of respect. The ashes of the dead fell like confetti over Horus' mighty army as thousands of traitor astards cheered. Their cries of Hail Horus! Hail Horus! Resounding long into the darkness. The missing Salamander's prime arch Vulcan's helm, lying in the scorched earth of Istvaran v in. The aftermath of the drop site massacre. Barely a handful of loyalist space marines escaped with their lives from Istvaran v to bring. Dreadful word of the further betrayal of four more space marine legions to the Emperor. A critically wounded Korax made the dangerous journey through the Imatrium back to Terra. Arriving 133 days after departing the Istvaran system and finally reaching the Sol system the heart of the Imperium to seek audience with the Emperor. Vulcan was missing and presumed dead, though he would later re-emerge after a harrowing journey back to Terra himself, to lead his legion once more. The Salamanders, along with the Iron Hands and the Raven God, would spend the remainder of the Horus heresy rebuilding their decimated legions and were to 
weakened to play any further role in the great conflict. In the days after the battle, the traitor legion salvaged a large number of vehicles, wargy and other war material from what the loyalist legions had left on the field. This salvage was repaired and modified for the traitor legion's use and then put back into frontline service to be used against the Imperium. Some of this equipment would still be in service with certain chaos. Space Marine Warbands in the late 41st millennium. Orbital space around Istvaran V was busy as the vessels of eight legions assumed formation prior to transit to the system jump point. Over 3,000 vessels jostled for position above the darkened fifth planet, their holds bursting with warriors. Sworn to the service of Horus. Tanks and monstrous war machines had been lifted from the planet with incredible efficiency and an armada greater than any in the history of the Great Crusade assembled to take the fire of war into the very heart of the Imperium. Following the victory of the Drop Site Massacre, Horus called for a conclave of the Prime Archs of all eight of the traitor legions aboard his flagship, the Vengeful Spirit. Five of the Prime Archs, including four who had fought at Istvaran V, met in person, including Horus, Fulgrim, Angren, Mortarian and Lorga. Three appeared through the use of hololithic emitters that transmitted their signals through the warp, including Pacharabo, the Knight, Haunter and Magnus the Red, who had only recently joined the traitors after the scouring of Prospero when the broken remains of his XVTH legion had been transported by Tsinch into the Eye of Terror to the planet of the sorcerers. The Thousand Sons, bitter at what they perceived as their betrayal by the Emperor, now willingly became the Eighth Traitor Legion. The Council of Traitor Primarchs made their plans for the next step in their war against the Emperor and then each legion went its way according to its assigned role. The fleets of Angren, Fulgrim, Mortarian, Lorga and Horus' own legion would rendezvous. At Mars, now that word had come from the tech priest Regulus, the Mechanicus liaison with the 63rd Expeditionary Fleet, of that planet's fall to Horus' supporters within the Mechanicus. During the internecine conflict known as the Schism of Mars, with the manufacturing facilities of Mundus Gamma and Mundus Aculum wrested from the control of the Emperor's forces, the forges of Mars were free to supply the War Master's army. The eager warriors of the Alpha Legion were singled out by Horus for a vital mission, one upon which the success of the entire venture could depend. Following Horus' manipulation of Lemon Russ into assaulting the home world of the Thousand Suns, the Space Wolves were known to be operating in the region of Prospero. In the nearby system of Condux, the white scars of Jagate Icon were sure to have received word of Horus' rebellion and would no doubt attempt to link up with the Space Wolves. Horus could not allow such a grave threat to appear and so the warriors of Alpharus were to seek out and attack these legions before they could join forces. The Night Haunter's fleet had already departed, bound for the planet of Sagwilsa, a remote world in the eastern fringe that lay shrouded in the shadow of a great asteroid belt. From there, the Night Lord's terror troops would begin a campaign of genocide against the Imperial Strongholds of Heralda and Thramas, star systems that, if not taken, would leave the flanks of the War Master's strike on Terra vulnerable to attack. The Thramas system was of particular importance, as it comprised a number of Mechanicus Forge worlds whose loyalty was still to the Emperor. This campaign would also serve to tie up the dreaded Dark Angels Legion, so that the forces of the Lion wouldn't be brought to bear against Horus and his upcoming campaign. 
against Terra. The ships of the Iron Warriors prepared to make the journey to the Fal system where a large fleet of Imperial Fist's vessels were known to be regrouping after a failed attempt to reach Istvaran V in time to join the Loyalist assault. The Rugal Dawn's warriors had played no part in the drop site massacre, Horus could not allow such a powerful Loyalist force to remain unmolested. The enmity between Bitter Pacharabo and Proud Dawn was well known, and it was with great relish that the Iron Warriors set off to do battle with their old rivals. With his flanks covered and the Space Marine forces that could potentially reinforce the heart of the Imperium. Soon to be embroiled in war, the traitors were ready to unleash seven Terran years of devastating civil war upon the Imperium in the name of Horus and the Dark Gods. Assassination Attempt on Horus Execution Team After learning of Horus' perfidy on Istvaran III, the sires and sciences of the various secret Imperial assassin clads were tasked by Malkador the Sigilite, the secret master of assassins, with the daunting task of slaying the arch-traitor Horus, for if they could accomplish this monumental undertaking, they could effectively crush the nascent rebellion against the Emperor before it could inflict further damage upon his Imperium. But every assassination attempt against the War Master had failed thus far. Though the operatives sent by the clads were their finest students and equal to the task, every attempt had resulted in failure. The assassins had thrown their most gifted students into a meat grinder, sending them in blind and Half prepared. Every strike against Horus was broken, and he had shrugged off each attempt. Without notice. Every time the clade masters met, they were forced to grimly listen to a catalogue of each other's failures. After the last failed attempt by clade Veninum, a new strategy was decided upon. With the advice of a special guest in the form of Constantin Valdor, the Captain General of the Legio. Custodes who served as the personal protectors of the Emperor, the Masters of the Clads. Realized that their mission plans were not flawed, they were simply not enough. No single assassin, no matter how well trained, no matter which clade they hailed from, could ever hope to terminate the Arch-Traitor alone. But a collective of killers, a strike team consisting of an elite unit of killers handpicked for the task, might be enough to succeed. There had never been a precedent for such an initiative, for the Emperor would have never sanctioned assassination as an official imperial policy. The deployment of an assassin was a delicate matter and never one taken lightly. In the past, the clads had fielded two or three of their operatives on a single mission when the circumstances were most extreme, but these assassins were always drawn from the same clade, and even this occurred only after much deliberation. Yet in this crucial and extreme instance, Malkador, serving as director primus of the clads, decided that more Drastic measures were needed to accomplish the assassin's singular goal. He authorized the creation of the first imperial execution force. Horus did not adhere to the rules of war, nor did he balk at the use of a tactic because it offended sensibilities. At Istvaran III he had bombed his sworn brethren, his own warriors even, into obliteration. Nothing no matter how vile, was beyond him. It was decided by the assassins that if they were to kill this foe, they could not limit themselves to the moral abstracts that had guided the clads in the past. They had to dare to exceed them. And so a select strike team of assassins was formed. An execution force, the first of its kind. Six assassins one from each clade, 
were gathered together and given the select task of killing Horus by any means necessary. In the meantime, the Dark Apostle Erebus had decided on a bold course of action of his own. He firmly believed that as long as the traitor legions followed Horus, all would be as it should and as the Dark Gods had promised. Victory would come soon enough, perhaps even sooner than any of them might expect, for after the latest assassination attempt on the War Master, Erebus had come to realize a truism of warfare, if a tactic could be used against Horus, then it could also be used by the traitors against the Emperor. Black Paria Within Imperial history, only one Black Paria has ever existed. He was a former Imperial assassin by the code name of Spear. Born as a human untouchable, he was captured by the Silent Sisterhood and brought to Terra, where the Clade Kilxus experimented upon and augmented him in an attempt to create a more powerful and deadly form of Kilxus assassin. It is not known whether these augmentations or his unnatural abilities made him a black parrier. Spear was eventually deemed too unstable and dangerous by his clade's masters to be left alive. He was placed in the care of the Sisters of Silence and was sent aboard one of their lone vessels, bound for the heart of a nearby sun. Unfortunately, this vessel was intercepted by a traitor vessel carrying the Dark Apostle Erebus of the Word Bearers Legion. Boarding the Sisters Vessel, the Word Bearers killed all aboard, with the exception of Spear. Sensing the usefulness of such a unique specimen, Erebus found a new purpose for his captive. He forced Spear to undergo a painful and vile chaotic ritual, in which a minor demon from the Imatrium was bonded with the former Imperial Assassin. This bonding created a highly dangerous apex predator a counter psyker capable of redirecting a psyker's attack directly back upon him. In order to utilize this ability, the Black Paria first had to obtain a sample of his target's blood. This was a necessary component that helped him synchronize with his target's schnick abilities in order to reflect their attacks. Two standard years later, following the events of the drop site massacre on Istvaran v, Erebus tasked his deadly minion to assassinate the Emperor. Spear spent an inordinate amount of time in order to painstakingly reach his ultimate goal a document that possessed a minute drop of the Emperor of Mankind's precious blood. Spear eventually obtained this document upon the world of Dagonit, which would bring him into direct conflict with the Imperial Execution Force. Dagonit As the Horus heresy progressed and word filtered throughout the galaxy of Horus Galactic Uprising, numerous worlds began to erupt into anarchy as the populations began to split over whether they should remain loyal to the Emperor or join the War Master. Dagonit was one such world, where Horus Lupical was second only to the Emperor in being celebrated by the people of the planet, statues in Horus Honor were raised everywhere, and the Dragonit I spoke of him as the Liberator. As the historic record went, in the early years of the Great Crusade, Dagonit had languished under the heel of a corrupt and venal priest king who ruled the planet through fear and superstition. Horus, at the head of his Lunar Wolves Legion, had come to Dagonit and freed the world accomplishing the deed with only one round of ammunition expended, the single shot he fired that dispatched the tyrannical priest king. The victory was one of the War Master's most celebrated triumphs, and it ensured he would be revered forever as Dagonit Savior. The Dagonit I clans had started the uprising against the Imperium when the heresy began. 
Dagon its imperial governor issued a formal statement of support for the cause of Horus. The world's nobles had declared in favor of Horus and rejected the rule of terror. The common people were the ones fighting back in the name of the emperor. There was blood in the streets of the Dagonitai capital city as soldiers fought soldiers and militia fought clan guards. Those who could flee the star system filled every starship they could get their hands on. It was small wonder that the aristocratic clans who now ruled the planet would give their banners to Horus instead of a distant emperor who had never set foot on their world. The execution force soon learned the future whereabouts of where Horus would be. Agents of the Imperium operating covertly in the Tabian sector report a strong likelihood that Horus was planning to bring his flagship, the Vengeful Spirit, to the planet Dagonit in order to show his flag. The Clads believed that the War Master's forces would use Dagonit as a foothold from which to secure the allegiance of every planet in the Tabian Star Sector. Dagonit was a keystone world in the politico-economic structure of the Tabian sector, and if it fell fully under the shadow of Horus, then it would mark the beginning of a domino effect, as planet after planet along the same trade axis followed suit. Every loyalist foothold in this sector of space would be in jeopardy. One imperial vessel would be able to slip through the warp to Dagonit, far easier than an entire reprisal fleet. Six assassins, the best of their clans, could bring death. The execution force would embed on Dagonit and set up multiple lines of attack. When Horus arrived there, they would terminate his command with extreme prejudice. Horus assassination at this juncture would throw the traitor forces into disarray and break the rebellion before it could advance onto the Segmentum Solar. The execution force successfully circumvented all detection and was able to secretly arrive upon Dagonit. The execution force gathered intelligence to determine what exactly had occurred on Dagonit. In the first moments of the insurrection, Desperate signals had been sent to the Space Marine Legions and their Legion fleets, but these had gone unanswered. Both the starships of the Admiralty and the Legions had battles of their own to fight, far from the Tabian stars. They would not intervene. For all the fire and destruction the collapse of Dagonit and its sister worlds might cause. There were larger conflicts being addressed, no crusade of heroes was coming to ride to the rescue. The civil war on Dagonit was a rout, and it was those who stood in the Emperor's name who were dying. Across the planet, the forces that carried Horus Banner were only days away from breaking the back of any resistance. Dagonit was already lost. The turncoat nobility on this planet did not need to see Horus to adhere to his banner. His influence hung over Dagonit like an eclipse blotting out the sun. They were fighting in his name. In fear of him, and that was enough. And when the traitors finally won, Horus' work would be done for him. This same thing was happening all across the galaxy, on every world too far from the Emperor and the Rule of Terror. When Dagonit fell, Horus would turn his face from this place and move on, his advance one step closer to the gates of the Imperial Palace. While gathering intelligence and deciding upon the best course of action, two of the execution Forces number decided to set about on a different course of action. The Venom assassin Jenica Solemn had become distracted by her mission with the plight of the local loyalist Dagonitai who continued to wage their desperate war against the Pro Horus planet's nobility. 
the day Gonitai introduced her to the forbidden writings of the Lectitio. Divinitatus which postulated the worship of the Emperor of Mankind as a divine being, the one true God of humanity. Solemn became a willing convert of this nascent religious movement and vowed to help the Dagonitai with their plight. Her interest in helping the people of Dagonit and her new spirituality created friction with the rest of the execution force, and so she took her leave, and the mission to assassinate Horus continued on without her. The Kilxus assassin Iota, who showed great interest in Solemn's quest, followed her. The pair of assassins soon came into conflict with the black parrier known as Spear. Realizing the dire threat of such a creature, the two assassins attacked the traitor assassin. In the ensuing battle, Solemn was mortally wounded. Iota utilized her animus speculum, unleashing her innate anti psycho abilities upon Spear, seriously wounding him in the process. Though Iota finally gained the upper hand, her efforts were for naught, as Spear was able to sample a drop of her spilt blood. This enabled the traitor assassin to engage his genetic lock using his own innate abilities to reflect Iota's attack back onto her, boiling the assassin in the crucible of her own powers. The dying Solemn was found by her brother Aristedkel, a Vindicare assassin and the execution forces team leader. Solemn made Kel promise to kill the traitor assassin, not out of vengeance, but for the sake of the god emperor. The execution force managed to salve Iota's memory coil from her animus speculum and review her confrontation with the creature known as Spear. Realizing the dire threat that this counter-assassin represented, the assassin's mission became twofold, assassinate Horus and kill the creature that had murdered their comrade. Moment of Truth The Sons of Horus Legion finally arrived in system at Dagonit. The vengeful spirit settled in orbit above the world of Dagonit. The vessel had brought a military force of such deadly intent and utter lethality that the planet and its people had never known the like in all their recorded history. And it was only the first. Other warships were following close behind. This was the Visitation granted to Dagonit by the Sons of Horus, the tip of a sword blade forged from shock. And or far below, on the planet's surface, across the white marble of Liberation Plaza, a respectful hush fell over the throng of people who had gathered. A pregnant hush fell over the Dagonitai, as they looked to the sky and awaited the arrival of their Redeemer, the owner of their New Allegiance Their war god, the war master Horus. At this time, the execution force was in place. The Vindicare assassin Kel waited in the perfect assassin's perch, ready for the war master's arrival. The Corlidus passed a measuring gaze over the nervous lines of Dagonitai planetary defense force soldiers and the robed nobles standing back on the Gleaming, sunlit steps of the Great Hall. Governor Nikrin was there among them, waiting with every other Dagonitai for the storm that was about to break. Suddenly, there was a blast of fanfare from the trumpets of a military band, and Governor Nikrin stepped forward. When he spoke, a vox beat at his throat amplified his voice. Glory to the Liberator! He cried. Glory to the War Master. Glory to Horus. The assembled crowd raised their voices in a thundering echo. A Vindicare assassin of the execution force takes aim and prepares to take out War Master. Horus. The sons of Horus teleported onto the planet's surface. The tallest of the superhuman warriors. His battle gear decked with more finery than the others, 
stepped forward. He was covered with honor chains and combat laurels, and about his shoulders he wore a metal dolman made. From Or's mind in the depths of Ksonia, the mantle of the War Master, forged by Horus. Captains as a symbol of his might and unbreakable will. He drew a gold chased bold pistol. Raising it up high above his head, and then he fired a single shot into the air, the round crashing. Like thunder. The same sound that rang about Dagon it on the day they were liberated. Before the empty shell casing could strike the marble at his feet, the crowd were shouting there. Fealty. Glory to Horus. The towering warrior holstered his gun and unsealed his helmet. Drawing it up so the world might see his face. This was the moment of truth. The Vindicare. Assassin placed his crosshairs on the center of the scowling grill of the War Master's helmet. There was no hesitation, no margin for error. The assassin fired his Exitus rifle. The shot struck. The target in the throat, reducing the flesh to atoms, superheating the fluids into steam, boiling. Skin and vaporizing bone. The only sound was the fall of the headless corpse as it crashed to the ground, blood jetting across the white marble and the War Master's shining mantle. Horus was dead. But the assassins of the execution force had been duped. Horus had sent a surrogate, a sacrificial proxy. The Vindicare had killed Luxedari, the captain of the Sons of Horus Thirteenth. Company. Though the warrior Kel shot wore the mantle of the War Master, the unique robe belonging to the Primarch himself, it had all been a ruse. In their anger, the sons of Horus turned upon the populace of Dagonit and began to slaughter them in earnest. Amidst the chaos and anarchy of the massacre of the entire populace of Dagonit, Kel finally tracked spear down and with the assistance and sacrifice of his fellow assassin, managed to finally draw out and kill the Black Parrier. Kel found himself was the lone survivor of the first Imperial Execution Force. The Vindicare assassin departed Dagonit and decided to make one last attempt on the War Master's life. He made a suicidal attack on Horus' flagship. Kel set his own ship on a direct course for the Vengeful Spirit's command bridge, where he seemed to meet his own fate when he ejected himself into space once he reached his intended target, in an ultimately vain attempt to land a desperate shot at Horus while he stood looking out of the battle barge bridge's armored observation deck into space. The execution force's assassination attempt had failed. In the aftermath of the events on Dagonit, Horus confronted Erebus within his private chambers. He chastised the Dark Apostle for his audacious plan to assassinate the Emperor, declaring that when the opportune moment finally dawned, it would be him and him alone who killed the Master of Mankind. Striking a blow for Horus. Battle of Kalth. Ultramarines survivors fight back against their foes. An Ultramarines tactical squad tries to search for survivors. Primarch rob out Gilliman and the Ultramarines fighting at Kalth. While Horus made his plans for what would become known as the infamous drop site. Massacre on Istvaran v. The War Master sent word to the 17 Legions Primarch Lorga that the Time had come for his astards, the word bearers, to strike against the Imperium. The War Master was keenly aware of the bitter hatred that Lorga had for his prime arch. Brother Rob out Gilliman and his Xiith Legion, the Ultramarines, who had once humiliated the word bearers by destroying their city of Monarchia on the world of Khur at the Emperor's orders. During the Great Crusade, the Ultramarines had taken no pleasure in this act, which was 
intended to teach Lorga and his astards to adhere to the atheistic doctrines of the imperial truth rather than spread the false belief that the emperor was divine to all the worlds that they conquered. Yet Lorga and the word bearers had never forgiven the ultramarines for this action and they longed for vengeance against the Xiith legion. Horace told Lorga that he had fed Gilliman false intelligence in regard to a possible threat. Within the Veridian system in the Segmentum Tempestus, far to the galactic south of Terra. This supposed threat stemmed from the Orcs of the Garslak Empire. Horace had ordered the Xiith and the Xviith legions to muster and meet at the world of Kalth in the Ultramarines realm of Ultramar, in order to conduct a massive joint campaign of extermination against the Garslak Zenahold, a common mission for the Astards during the final days of the Great Crusade. It would be at Kalth that Lorga would launch a surprise attack on the Ultramarines whilst they were gathered for the campaign against the Orcs of Garslak. The Xiith Legion would be caught completely unaware while the word bearers would use the advantage of surprise to completely annihilate their hated rivals. The assault at Kalth would also allow the word bearers to reveal that they, too, now served ruinous powers. Kalth was not chosen as the site of the confrontation between the word bearers and the ultramarines by chance, for the word bearers intended to destroy one of the jewels in the ultramarines realm of Ultramar, then known as the Ultramar Coalition, just as the Xiith Legion had destroyed one of the word bearers' greatest achievements, the sacred city of Monarchia, four decades earlier. Horus ordered the majority of the Xviith Legion to Ultrama, and the dark powers of the warp gave them sure and swift passage across the increasingly restless Imatrium. As the word bearers entered Ultrama space, Lorga prepared his legion for the inevitable slaughter that would follow. Command of the main assault force was given to Corfran, the first. Captain of the Xviith Legion and one of Lorga's most favored champions. Kalth was to be core. Corfran's operation to execute, far more than it was Lorga's. Corfran had planned the assault of Kalth for his prime arch meticulously, and executed it with the aid of the dark. Apostle Erebus. The punishment and annihilation of the Xiith Legion was the campaigns. Principal aim, the humiliation and execution of Lorga's hated rival Robout Gilliman was a secondary objective. But for Lorga, the assault would also mark his first opportunity to gain true favor in the eyes of the dark gods he now served, to prove to them that he had earned his place as their chosen one. The word bearers turned Kalth's own orbital defense platforms on the Veridian star, stripping away the outer layers of its photosphere and destabilizing it, ultimately rendering the surface of Kalth uninhabitable. At the same time, the word bearers had used the battle taking place on Kalth to summon a massive warp storm called the Ruin Storm, that was intended to cut off. Ultramar from the rest of the galaxy and prevent the Ultramarines from providing any reinforcements to Terra as Horus made his assault upon humanity's home world. The eruption of the Ruin Storm cut off Kalth from the main body of the Ultramarines Legion and left the Astards of the Xiith Legion trapped on Kalth locked in a brutal subterranean war with those word bearers units that had also been left behind when their legion retreated from the Viridian system. Yet, despite the Loyalists' last-minute victory and the survival of the Ultramarines, Legion and its prime arch, the forces of Chaos could consider their assault on Kalth a success. The Xiith Legion had been badly crippled and no longer presented a viable threat to Horus' plan to drive on terror. 
Erebus had managed to complete his blasphemous ritual on Kalthas' surface, which summoned a ruin storm to the galaxy's eastern fringe a monstrous warp storm larger and more destructive than anything spacefaring humanity had witnessed since the days of the Age of Strife. It would split the void asunder, dividing the galaxy in two and rendering vast tracts of the Imperium impassable for centuries. The Ruin Storm would also isolate and trap those loyalist forces caught behind it like the Ultramarines, preventing them from coordinating their efforts and supporting one another as the traitor legions moved towards terror. It would even prevent them from warning each other, for a time, of the War Master's betrayal and the civil war that had begun to consume the Imperium. The Ruin Storm would leave Terra alone in the void, infinitely vulnerable to the approaching shadow of Horus. Sinus Prime When the Imperial War Master Horus, the greatest of the Emperor's genetic sons, fell to the temptations of the Chaos Gods and became swayed by their promises of power, he sought to sway his brother Primarchs to his cause. Horus and Sanguinius the Prime Arch of the Blood. Angels Legion, had fought many campaigns by each other's side. Their relationship was so close. It had even incited jealousy amongst their brother Prime Archs on occasion. But in his black heart, Horus knew that Sanguinius would never willingly betray their father, and so he had formulated an audacious plan to either convert the Blood Angels Legion to his cause or utterly destroy them. To this end, Horus had discovered decades earlier a carefully guarded secret of the Blood Angels when he fought alongside Sanguinius Nine Legion in a xenocidal campaign on the world of Melchia. Horus had come upon his brother Primarch in a sunken ruin of an alien chapel and had witnessed the unthinkable Sanguinius murdering one of his own astuts. Sanguinius explained his actions to his bewildered brother. He had discovered that within his own genome, there was a tray that lay buried and waiting to be awakened. This genetic flaw would later be known as the Red Thirst. Sanguinius had been aware of the flaw in his genome for several years keeping the truth from the Emperor and his fellow Primarchs. Some of the Angel's sons had learned a measure of the truth, but only Ascalon, first Captain Raldoran, the IXTH Legion's master apothecary on the Legion home world of Bull and a few others were fully aware of the extent of this affliction. They were united with Sanguinius in finding a way to repair this flaw. Horus swore to his brother that he would never speak of this matter to anyone, even their father. He would keep this promise for as long as Sanguinius wished him to. The angel was touched by his brother's gesture and expressed his gratitude. Horus solemnly vowed to help Sanguinius deal with this matter, however long it took. Little did they know at the time that one day a corrupted Horus would take full advantage of this knowledge and attempt to turn the Blood Angels' floor against them. Blood Angels' veteran assault marine confronting a demonet. Decades later, Horus exploited this knowledge of the Blood Angels' genetic floor. The War Master had found a way to sway his beloved brother's legion to his cause and the service of the Chaos Gods. In his capacity as Imperial War Master, Horus ordered Sanguinus to gather his entire legion and make for the Sinus Cluster, a triple star system located in the Ultima Segmentum near the Eastern Fringe. His IXTH legion was to cleanse the seven worlds and fifteen moons that comprised the Sinus Cluster of Zeno's invaders and release the humans settled there from their Zeno's overlords. To further entice Sanguinius, the War Master informed him that he had 
found the means by which the blood angels would be able to excise the darkness from within their souls, and rid themselves of the floor. If Sanguinius obeyed the War Master's command in this matter, then Horus promised him that the Blood Angels would find a new freedom. Sanguinius had no reason to doubt Horus, for they were as close as two brothers could be. Many of their fellow Primarchs were even jealous of the closeness between the pair. Sanguinius relished the opportunity to once again prove the value of their bond, and so the Blood Angels. Legion gathered in its entirety and duly set course for the Sinus Cluster, unaware that they were heading into a terrible trap. Unaware of the War Master's perfidy, Sanguinius willingly obeyed his brother Primarch and immediately set out for this volatile region of space. Unbeknownst to the Blood Angels, they were blindly walking into a deadly trap, for the Sinus Cluster had fallen prey to agents of the ruinous powers and become a veritable realm of chaos a system of hellish demon worlds under the rule of a greater demon of Slanesh known as Kiris the Perverse. When the Blood Angels arrived in system, their fleet was ambushed by the malevolent forces of the Warp crippling or killing many of their navigators and astropaths in the initial onslaught. The Blood Angels now faced the fury of chaos for the first time. Kiris sent an image of himself to Sanguinius, declaring his lordship over the system in the name of Slanesh and taunting the Primarch into taking it back from him. Though they had never faced such a foe, the Blood Angels prepared their counter-attack, sure that they would prevail. Rising to the challenge of the vile greater demon, the Blood Angels Legion attacked the demon host of Kiris, launching a series of attacks across the seat of the demon's power, the world of Sinus Prime. Primarch Sanguinius fights the Bloodthirster K.A. Banda on the demon world of Sinus Prime. During the epic battle, Sanguinius came face to face with a new nightmare known as K.A. Banda, a greater demon of Khorn. During the battle that ensued, Sanguinius was sorely wounded and temporarily incapacitated. He witnessed K.A. Banda slaughter 500 of his sons with huge swathes of his mighty axe. The psychic backlash of the deaths of so many of his Sons blasted Sanguinius into unconsciousness. With the fall of their Primarch and the slaughtering of their brethren, the Blood Angels Legion was consumed by a black rage that drove them into a berserkous fury as they charged into the demonic horde and in their madness they smashed the horde of demons asunder. Yet the brutal violence of the demon K.A. Banda had unleashed something dark within the psyche of the Space Marines, a thirst for blood that would not be slaked until every taint of chaos had been erased from the planet. Even the mighty Kiris was banished back to the Imatrium. Only when the planet was cleansed did the rage of the Blood Angels finally subside. Though Sinus had been freed from its thrall to the forces of chaos, the cost of victory was far higher than any could have wished. The berserker rage the Blood Angels had experienced had left a brooding shadow on their souls that would manifest in the centuries to come as the Great Curse, later known as the Black Rage, that would afflict the Blood Angels and their later successors. Battle of Terror Landing on Terror War Master Horus aboard his ship, the Vengeful Spirit, directing the traitor legions during the Siege of Terror. The Battle of Terror began with an orbital bombardment by the War Master Horus fleet as the prelude to invasion. Although the Loyalist fleets and defenders fought back and the massive orbital defenses on Luna reaped more than a quarter of the starships in the traitor fleet they like the Loyalist soldiers on the surface, were too few to face the combined forces of so many 
traitor legions, and were mowed down without mercy. After days of bombardment, the chaos. Space Marines landed on the surface of Terra in drop pods and advanced on the two spaceports. Nearest the location of the Imperial Palace to secure them in preparation for the main landings. Of the traitor forces. Elements from five of the traitor legions participated in the battle, aided by the traitor forces already on the surface. Despite the brave efforts of the loyalists, the Eternity Wall and the Lion's Gate spaceports fell within hours to the forces of chaos. Dark chaos. Cultists made their invocations, calling down the greater daemons of chaos from the warp directly on two Terran soil. With the spaceports secured, Horus remaining troops of the traitor legions and their traitor imperial army and dark mechanicus support forces landed en mass, and the hulking transports carried thousands of troops each. They also landed the terrible traitor titans that served the war master's cause and had been infected with the Demonic power of chaos. The transport's immense size made them prime targets for terrors. Defense lasers. Although many of the traitor landing craft were destroyed in atmosphere, many more made it to the surface, disgorging yet more soldiers, main battle tanks and traitor titans to add to the besiegers' strength. They met stiff resistance from the loyalists as the Imperial. Defenders knew that the survival of the mankind's home world, their emperor, and the future of the entire human race rested on their shoulders. Siege of the Imperial Palace The traitor legions lay siege to the Imperial Palace during the Battle of Terror. Imperial army soldiers holding out against the vast tides of chaos. Loyalists fight against the onslaught of the traitor legions. Blood Angels Astards defending the inner palace from the tides of chaos. The chaotic besiegers forced the Imperial defenders back to the walls of the Imperial Palace. Where thousands died slowing the assault. The Prime Archangren of the World Eaters Legion. Now a demon prince of the Blood God Khorn, came forth before the walls of the palace and demanded the loyalists surrender, saying that they were cut off outnumbered, and defended a ruler unworthy of their loyalty. Many would have surrendered to Angren after seeing the sheer power of the forces of chaos that stood arrayed before them had it not been for the Prime Arch Sanguinius, the winged and seemingly angelic leader of the Blood Angels Legion. The two Prime Archs, once brothers, gazed at each other perhaps communicating telepathically. Eventually Angren withdrew from before the gates of the Imperial Palace, telling his forces, not without some relish at the prospect of slaughter, that there would be no surrender. The siege of the Imperial Palace then began in earnest. Three times the forces of chaos scaled the walls and three times were hurled back by Sanguinius and his blood angels. Outside the palace walls, Space Marine and Imperial Army forces led by Jagate Icon, the Prime Arch of the White Scars Legion, unsuccessfully tried to draw the bulk of the besiegers' army away from the palace. Soon the outnumbered defenders were pushed back into the maze of corridors and bulwarks within the palace walls. Frustrated with his army's slow progress, Horus ordered the Legio Mortis, Death's Head Legion, a traitor titan legion, to demolish entire sections of the wall. Despite grievous losses, the titans, led by the infamous Imperator-class battle titan dies. Eerie, gouged open breaches in the Imperial Palace's defenses which the traitors then flooded through. Facing a breach and potential collapse of the Imperial defenses, Jagate Icon decided on a change of plan. 
rather than assaulting the almost invincible flanks of the chaotic army, Khan redirected his highly mobile White Scar Space Marines and the surviving Loyalist tank divisions of the Imperial Army to Lion's Gate Spaceport. At dawn Jagate AI's lightning raid caught the traitor garrison at the spaceport completely by surprise, and reclaimed the spaceport for the Imperium. The Khan ordered his troops to reactivate the spaceport's defense lasers to prevent the traitor fleet from bringing down any more troops and equipment and former defensive perimeter to hold their newly reconquered territory. Khan's troops repelled several frenzied counter-attacks from the traitors, and began firing on Horus' unprotected drop ships. The Khan's plan worked perfectly, the flow of the traitors' men and machines to the Imperial Palace had been cut in half at a single stroke. Inspired by this success, the Loyalists also tried to seize back the Eternity Wall spaceport, but were driven back by the Chaos forces without difficulty, as they had reinforced their garrison following the loss of the Lion's Gate. Inside the palace, the defenders had been forced back to the Eternity Gate, the sole point of entry into the inner sanctum of the Imperial Palace. The Astards of the Blood Angels and Imperial Fists tried to hold back the attacking chaotic troops, while the remaining Loyalists made it through the gate. Soon the mighty bloodthirster greater Demon K.A. Banda came forth and bellowed out a challenge to Sanguinius in the name of his Master Khorn. The demon hurled itself at the Angel of Baal, barely allowing him time to parry. The demon strikes. The two took to the air, trading blows and battle cries high above the heads of the two forces. Already fatigued from the long siege, Sanguinius was cast down by the demon, pulverizing the ferrocrete below upon impact. The loyalist forces seemed to collectively groan at the fall of their great champion. Yet the Blood Angel's prime arch was not beaten, only stunned by the force of the impact. Sanguinius cleared his head, forced himself back to his feet, and once again took to the sky. The angel seized the gloating demon, holding it by the right ankle and arm. The prime arch hefted the creature high and broke its back over his knee before hurling the demon's carcass back at the besiegers, who howled in despair as the last loyalists fell back and made it into the imperial palace's inner sanctum before the great portal of the Eternity Gate was shut tight behind them. Of course, as a demon, K.A. Bunda could not truly be slain, only banished to the warp for a 1,000 standard years but the bloodthirster's spirit was sent howling back into the Imatrium to meet the displeasure of his master the Blood God. The Eternity Gate was closed. Inquisition The Emperor of Mankind upon the Golden Throne The warp gate the Emperor had constructed deep beneath the Imperial Palace and the short section of Woodway Passage beyond required constant maintenance lest they fall into ruin. At first this demanded only a small portion of the Emperor's psychic might and so he was able to command his armies and do all that was expected of him as Emperor. But the hideous monstrosities that ruled the warp the self-proclaimed gods of chaos had ever been his foes, and now conspired to subvert the Emperor's goals as they had since the day he had launched the Great Crusade. To this end they had tempted the naive Magnus the Red to warn him of the very plot they had initiated, the betrayal of the Imperium by Horus. Magnus sent his warning by means of powerful psychic sorcery and this broadcast had wreaked havoc upon the protective psychic shielding surrounding the Emperor's fragile woodway construct. The spell of 
Magnus not only allowed the foul denizens of the warp entry to the section of the Wubwe the Emperor's secret army of adepts and tech priests had by then conquered, it destroyed the delicate controls the Emperor had set in place. Now the warp gate he had constructed required virtually all of his psychic power and mental concentration lest it rip open a permanent doorway between Terra and the warp flooding the home world of mankind with the demonic legions of the ruinous powers. The Emperor told Malkador that he had to take the Emperor's place on the psychic amplifier, known as the Golden Throne, which provided the psychic sheath needed to protect the new human-built sections of the Woodway intended to be the Emperor's final gift to humanity before the Horus Heresy had begun. The Emperor's original choice of his replacement on the artifact had been the Prime Arch Magnus the Red, but since Magnus and his Thousand Sons Space Marine Legion had sided with Horus and the Chaos God Tsinch, Malkador was now his chosen successor and the only remaining human psyker with enough strength to carry out the duty. In the days before the final confrontation between the Emperor and Horus aboard his battle, Barge the Vengeful Spirit during the Battle of Terror, the Emperor ordered Malkador to summon twelve men of character, skill and determination who would be tested and trained to become the elite group of investigators intended to root out treachery across the Imperium in the Centuries to come to prevent any event like the Horus heresy from occurring again. The Emperor also told Malkador to prepare himself for the dreadful sacrifice that he would be called upon to make. Malkador the Hero Malkador the Sigilite, Regent of Terror The Terran Warp Gate would remain closed to the Daemons for as long as the Emperor was able to power it from his throne atop the Golden Portal. Only the mightiest of human psychers had power enough to do this and even then most would be exhausted and fail in a short time. Only the Emperor himself had the might to keep the gate closed permanently and for him the effort grew harder as the demonic forces gathered about him. For as long as the demon horde Threatened to breach the portal, the Golden Throne would be his prison. As Horus forces began, their final assault on the Sol system and the Battle of Terror began seven standard years after the traitors had first turned upon the servants of the Emperor at Istvaran III, the Sigilite returned from his mission to recruit the foundation of the Inquisition. Only through the most artful of Psychic subterfuge were Malkador and his new recruits able to pass unscathed through the battle lines and come unharmed and unseen before the Emperor within the inner sanctum of the Imperial Palace. Malkador had finally received the call and was now prepared to perform his final duty to the man he had followed for the greater part of his life. Once within the depths of the Imperial Palace, the Emperor asked if Malkador was prepared to take his place upon the Golden Throne. Ever loyal, the Sigilite was more than willing to sacrifice himself for his Emperor. But before he ascended to take his place upon the throne, the Sigilite had one last duty to perform. He was accompanied by a group of twelve hooded attendants. In stern silence the Emperor surveyed the robed figures that Malkador had brought before him, and he saw that his faithful servant had done well. Of the twelve, four were mortal lords and administrators of the Imperium possessed of an inquisitive nature and unyielding strength of mind. The other eight were space marines whose abilities were as peerless as their dedication to the Emperor. Some hailed from Legions that had abandoned the Emperor's light in favor of Horus' dark promises, but these battle brothers had never lost their loyalty and had fought the heresy from within. Folsom in 
his approval of the selection, Malkador the Sigilite ascended to the Golden Throne, replacing the Emperor who now stood before the edifice with his loyal captains Rigel, Dawn and Sanguinius. Malkador could not speak, such was the concentration he had to bring to bear in order to control the tempestuous forces at his call. The Emperor directed the attention of the two mighty Primarchs, behold the greatest sacrifice of our age. Malkador the Sigilite is no more. Henceforth he shall always and only ever be Malkador the hero. At this the three figures retired from the imperial palace's vault and made ready to teleport onto the battle barge of Horus. The task of keeping the daemons out of the imperial palace was daunting for the emperor, the mighty reincarnation of a thousand human psychers with millennia of experience to call upon. Though he was a powerful psyker in his own right, Malkador was still but a mere human, his Mental powers nothing compared to that of the Emperor, and this task proved overwhelming. Consuming him body and soul in a matter of hours. Endgame. Sanguinius confronts his former brother Primarch, the corrupted Warmaster Horus. The siege of terror following the initial assault on the Imperial Palace lasted for 55 solar days. Both sides knew that the defeat of the Imperium of Man was near after the defense of the Eternity Gate. Sensing this, and knowing that he must complete the siege before the arrival of Loyalist reinforcements from the other Space Marine legions that were already on their way, Horus prepared to teleport to the surface from his flagship, the Vengeful Spirit, to lead his forces in person. Before this could happen, the word bearer's first chaplain Erebus broke the news to Horus, their demonic allies in the warp had informed them that the Dark Angels and Space Wolf's legions were nearing terror, and the Ultramarines were only a short distance behind. At that moment, Horus despaired, his gamble had failed, weeks of further conflict would be needed to break the defenders and the Emperor's reinforcements would arrive in mere hours. What happened next is disputed in the Imperial Historiography of the Heresy, some believe. Horus disabled his void shields as he experienced one last moment of regret for his betrayal of his father and his turn to chaos, while others believe it was a personal challenge to the Emperor. Nevertheless, Horus lowered the void shields of his flagship, the enormous battle. Barge Vengeful Spirit The lowering of the vessel's shields was detected by the loyalist vessels. In orbit and the information was relayed to the Imperial Palace. The Emperor of Mankind rose to the challenge, leading members of his elite personal guard. The Legio Custodes, the Primarch Sanguinius and Rigel Dawn and several companies of Imperial Fists and Blood Angels veteran Space Marines in the assault and teleported aboard. The Vengeful Spirit Horus used his chaotic powers to scatter the Emperor's force throughout the massive warship when they teleported up through the warp. Each fought a series of battles against the elite forces of chaos aboard the corrupted starship attempting to link up with their comrades and confront Horus. It was Sanguinius who reached his brother Horus first. The War Master attempted to turn the Blood Angels Primarch, his oldest and closest friend among the other Primarchs, to Chaos One. Last time, when Sanguinius refused to be corrupted, Horus attacked. Wounded from his many Battles on Terra and the terrible battle with the demon K.A. Bunda, Sanguinius proved to be no match for Horus, now at the peak of his demonic power after his long alliance with the ruinous powers. Horus strangled the Angel of Baal with ease. An alternate version of this event, sometimes recorded in the Imperial records has Sanguinius cutting a small hole in 
Horus Terminator armor before he died, as this hole aided in the Emperor's final defeat of Horus. The Emperor confronts Horus on the battleship Vengeful Spirit after the death of Sanguinius. When the Emperor finally entered the throne room of the Vengeful Spirit, he saw the winged corpse of the angelic Sanguinius lying at Horus' feet. Horus called the Emperor foolish for refusing the power that the Chaos Gods offered to men, and timid for not taming them to his will. If he was truly the master of mankind as he claimed, Horus proclaimed that if the Emperor would kneel before him, then he would spare his life. But the Emperor, tens of millennia older than his misguided and once beloved son, knew well the ancient trap that had snared Horus. The Emperor told the corrupted Primarch that he was the deluded slave of chaos, not its master, for no mortal could ever truly claim to be more than simply a pawn of the ruinous powers. Snarling, Horus hurled bolts of demonic lightning at the Emperor, but the Emperor nullified them with his own immense psychic abilities. The die was cast. Each godlike being knew that the fate of humanity now hung in the balance. The Emperor and Horus engaged one another in the throne room of the massive battleship, a battle that was both physical and psychic in nature. Though the Emperor's psychic gifts and martial skills were unequaled, he found himself unwilling to summon his full strength against his beloved son. The Emperor suffered grievous wounds at Horus' hands, and after a score of thrusts, parries and counter-thrusts between the Emperor's rune sword and his own lightning claw, Horus sliced open the Emperor's chest armor, then opened his jugular and severed the tendons in his right wrist, disarming the Emperor. A psychic blast seared the flesh from the Emperor's face, destroying one of the Master of Mankind's eyes. After tearing the Emperor's right arm from its socket, Horus raised his father's broken body high over his head, and broke his back over his knee. At that moment, a lone loyalist warrior entered the bridge, just as the Emperor fell. Horus Gloating in victory, showed the imperial warrior the emperor's broken form and laughed. Taunting the loyalists' uselessness and defeat. The valiant imperial warrior, far from being daunted, roared in defiance and interposed himself between the emperor and the war master. Heroically holding the line against the chaos corrupted Primarch. He was flayed alive for his defiance by a glancing psychic blast from Horus. The Emperor and Horus' father and son face one another for the last time. The exact identity of the brave warrior is a source of much debate amongst Imperial historians. For today only the Emperor knows the truth. The Adeptus Ministorum tell the story that it was a lone Imperial army trooper named Olanius Pius who held the line going as far as to canonize the man as the guardian saint of the imperial guard in the 32nd millennium, yet many doubt that mere humans would have accompanied the emperor and his primarchs to confront Horus. The imperial fists maintain it was one of their terminators who challenged Horus, however. Some see this as a desperate attempt to lessen their collective guilt stemming from the fact that Rigaldorn never could participate in the fighting. Most savants now agree that it was probably one of the Adeptus Custodes who interceded, yet the other stories continue to be told and retold over the whole of the Imperium of Man. The casual brutality of the War Master's Act galvanized the Emperor as he realized what awaited mankind under the rule of Horus and the Chaos Gods. Realizing at last that his favored son was truly lost to the corruption of chaos, the emperor finally gathered his full and awesome psychic power in the imatrium and unleashed a lance of pure warp energy that 
pierced the gloating Horus psychic defenses and ripped his body apart. In some versions of the tale, this blast was only able to pierce Horus' body through the hole that had been made by Sanguinius before his death. Just before Horus died, he looked his father in the eye, shedding a single tear, begging his father to forgive him for his betrayal. The Emperor saw regret in his fallen son's eyes. The Emperor also knew that the ruinous powers could attempt to possess Horus again, and that he would not be there to stop his son again if they did. Driving all of the near infinite reserves of compassion from his mind for the sake of the humanity he had served and loved all the years of his long life, the Emperor destroyed Horus utterly his essence burned from existence in both the physical world and the Imatrium so that the ruinous powers could not resurrect Horus as a demon prince through their claim on his soul. The Emperor and the War Master Horus, now the greatest champion of Chaos Undivided, meet each other in their final battle aboard the Vengeful Spirit as the Siege of Terror reaches its climax. Far below the destruction of Horus' soul sent a psychic shockwave surging across the solar system, casting the demons of chaos back into the warp, and spreading mass panic among the traitor legions and other traitor forces on the surface of Terra in seconds as the chaos gods found. Their powers disrupted temporarily by the death of their favored mortal vessel. It became clear to the forces of chaos that their leader had been defeated. A terrible, berserk fury later known as the Black Rage had encompassed the Blood Angels at the moment of their Prime Archer's death. And they were surging forth to scatter the attackers. Retreat turned to rout, and rout soon turned to bloodbath. Thousands upon thousands of chaos space marines and chaos titans fell. Attempting to flee, the ground before the Sanctum Imperialis ran red with the blood of traitors and heretics. After death, the tragic tale of Horus does not end with his death aboard the Vengeful Spirit. His body was enshrined on the demon world of Malium that the sons of Horus claimed for their own. Within the Eye of Terror after they fled Terror at the end of the heresy. Horus' corpse resided there for several hundred Terran years in the early 31st millennium, before the body was stolen by the corrupted apothecary Fabius Bile and the Emperor's children traitor legion during the slave wars in the Eye of Terror. This was part of an attempt to clone the body of the War Master to bring Horus back to life so that he might lead the traitor legions once more in an attempt to Conquer the Imperium. But Ezekiel Abaddon, the former first captain of the XV Legion, reasserted his control over the entire Legion at this time, proclaiming himself Horus' successor. Abaddon led an assault by the sons of Horus upon the Emperor's children's fortress, and believing that the continued Worship of his legion's dead Primarch had trapped the traitor legions and led them to the brink of destruction, Abaddon utterly destroyed Horus' corpse and claimed the War Master's power. Claw, the Talon of Horus, as his own, as well as the title of War Master of Chaos. Abaddon also underwent an epiphany in which he believed that Horus, whom he had once worshipped, had failed to defeat the Emperor because he was weak, and so the forces of Chaos needed a new leader who would not hesitate to do what had to be done in the long war to at last throw down the corpse Emperor. Abaddon ordered the sons of Horus to paint their power armor black as a symbol of both mourning for Horus and their desire for vengeance against the Imperium. He gave the XV Legion a new name, the moniker that now breeds fear into the heart of every true servant of the Emperor who hears it spoken aloud. The Black Legion Abaddon ordered the Legion to abandon Malium and instead transformed his forces into 
a fleet-based legion that maintained assets across the expanse of the Eye of Terror. Abaddon turned the Black Legion's eyes towards the future and away from the past represented by their lost Primarch. He swore that the Black Legion would one day fulfill Horus' dream of throwing down the Corpse Emperor from his throne and establishing the Dominion of Chaos across the galaxy. And so Ezekiel Abaddon became something more than he had been, something more than even Horus Lupical's successor he became the greatest champion of chaos the galaxy had ever known, the feared tyrant and genocidal killer known to generations of imperial defenders. As Abaddon the Despoiler Warji Warmaster Horus arrayed in his fearsome panoply of war. Serpent's Scales Horus' unique suit of Terminator armor, known as the Serpent's Scales, was one of the first prototypes of its kind, fashioned by Master Adept Ertzi. Malevolous and continuously improved by the hand of the traitorous Fabricator General of Mars, Kelbor Hal, and some of the greatest artificers of the Imperium. It was proof against attacks of both brute and esoteric origin sent from Mars to cement the alliance between Horus and the faction of the Mechanicum that would back his rebellion against the Emperor, the armor echoed the colors of the sons of Horus elite just Erin, but it far surpassed them in ornamentation and power. An amber eye of Horus upon the breastplate stared from the armor's torso and shoulder plates. Worldbreaker Worldbreaker was a power maul the size of a mortal man marked out, with the Imperial Aquila at the base of its grip, as well as being a weapon capable of shattering armored Karamite, it was also a signifier of Horus' rank as the War Master of the Imperium. It is said to have been created by the hand of the Emperor himself and Presented as a gift to his favored son on the day Horus was raised to become the War Master and the Emperor announced that he was returning to Terra. War Master's Talon The War Master's Talon is a unique lightning claw which incorporated a baroque style twin bolter that was a precursor of a modern storm. Bolter The Talon had long been Horus' favored weapon. Some apocryphal sources Claim it was an antediluvian relic that was found deep within the planet Xonia, and was a product of mankind's dark age of technology. Videos Warhammer 40,000 Grim Dark Law Part 12 The Son of Strife Warhammer 40,000 Grim Dark Law Part 17 Triumph at Ulanor Warhammer 40,000 Grim Dark Law Part 20 Serpent in the Garden Warhammer 40,000 Grim Dark Law Part 21 Horus Falling Warhammer 40,000 Grim Dark Law Part 22 Traitors Warhammer 40,000 Grim Dark Law Part 24 Dark Gambits Warhammer 40,000 Grim Dark Law Part 25 Heresy Warhammer 40,000 Grim Dark Law Part 27 Massacre Warhammer 40,000 Grim Dark Law Part 29 The Siege Warhammer 40,000 Grim Dark Law Part 30 Imperium Invictus Sources Codex, Chaos Space Marines, 6th edition, pp. 6, 8-12, 14, 20, 23, 40, 48, 57, 62, 69 Codex, Chaos Space Marines, 4th edition, pp. 12 to 15, 22, 46. Codex, Chaos Space Marines, 3rd edition, 1st revision, pp. 4 to 5, 44. Codex, Chaos Space Marines, 3rd edition, pg. 22. Codex, Chaos, 2nd edition, pp. 8 to 11, 17 to 18, 98 to 99. Codex, Space Marines, 4th edition. 
Death Watch, First Founding, RPG, pp. 7, 14, 20, 37, 76 to 82, 90 to 91. Horus Heresy, Collected Visions, pp. 9, 45 to 47, 49 to 50, 54, 58, 62, 65, 70, 73, 75, 78, 81, 82, 98, 109 to 110, 113 to 114, 127, 129, 132, 158, 164, 171 to 172, 188, 196, 226 to 228, 230, 249, 250, 252, 256, 261, 265, 272, 276, 279, 290, 296, 299, 307, 313, 315, 324, 330 to 332, 334, 336, 342, 344, 346 to 347, 352 to 354, 356 to 369. Index Astats for Sons of Horus, the Black Legion Space Marine Legion. Realm of Chaos, The Lost and the Damned, 2nd Edition, pp. 9, 164, 177 to 184. Realm of Chaos, Slaves to Darkness, 2nd Edition, pp. 240 to 241, 243 to 244, 268. The Horus Heresy Betrayal, Book 1 by Alan Bly, pp. 22 to 25, 29, 40 to 41, 44, 47 to 51, 55, 64, 66 to 70. 78 to 83, 244 to 247. Warhammer 40,000 Rulebook, 6th edition, pp. 137, 158, 160 to 161, 168, 183, 186, 225. 228, 380, 403. White Dwarf 268, U.S., Assault on Holy Terror, Abaddon the Despoiler and Index. Astat's First Founding, Sons of Horus, The Black Legion Space Marine Chapter. Horus Rising, Novel, by Dan Abnett. False Gods, Novel, by Graham McNeil. Galaxy in Flames, Novel, by Ben Counter. Flight of the Eisenstein, Novel, by James Swallow. Fulgrim, Novel, by Graham McNeil. A Thousand Sons, Novel, by Graham McNeil. Nemesis, Novel, by James Swallow. The First Heretic, Novel, by Aaron Dembski Bowden. Prospero Burns, Novel, by Dan Abnett. Age of Darkness, Anthology, edited by Christian Dunn, Little Horus by Dan Abnett. Deliverance Lost, Novel, by Gav Thorpe. Betrayer, Novel, by Aaron Dembski Bowden. Vengeful Spirit, Novel, by Graham McNeil. The Talon of Horus, Novel, by Aaron Dembski Bowden. Forge World, Horus the War Master, Prime Arch of the Sons of Horus. Expand the Primarchs. Expand Raven Rock videos. 
Categories Languages Community content is available under CC by SA unless otherwise noted. More fandoms Fantasy Sci-fi AD Recent images Abriel's Claw Two hours ago Abriel's Claw A day ago Abriel's Claw A day ago Others like you also viewed Primarch Emperor of Mankind Horus Heresy Black Legion Robout Gilliman Sanguinius Abaddon Fulgrim Magnus the Red Popular Pages Primarch Emperor of Mankind Blood Angels Space Marines Space Marine Legions AD 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 Explore Properties Fandom Muthid Fanatical Follow Us Overview What is Fandom? About Careers Press Contact Terms of Use Privacy Policy Digital Services Act Global Site Map Local Site Map Community Community Central Support Help Advertise Media Kit Contact Fandom Apps Take your favorite fandoms with you and never miss a beat. Warhammer 40k Wiki is a fandom games community. View mobile site. Follow on TikTok Yuan Fan Lab. Search this wiki. Search all wikis.